Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Buy Round Interview Show. Now today we have a very special guest, uh, somebody that I guess some younger viewers would know as the Rugby League Players Association CEO. But before that, we actually shared the field a couple of times together, uh, going up against each other for St. Helens versus Hull KR. Nearly come to blows a couple of yeah. times. Uh, another a premiership winner as well with the with the Melbourne Storm. None other than Clint Newton. Good to be here. Yeah, great feel, to have you on. Feel privileged. I've seen some of the guests that you've had on, and you know, being a part of a show that the cheese is on, I, I feel extra, <laughs> extremely blessed. Well, that's my seat. This is cheese's seat, so he, he doesn't like anyone else to sit in this. Uh, how are we going? Back from Las Vegas. Uh, we back on Sydney time. Yeah, I mean, what a what a um, what an experience that was. Uh, I was, you know, really glad and uh, to be a part of it. Uh, I think it was a real milestone moment for the game. There's lots to come out of it. I think there's, you know, some significant opportunities that we've we've got, you know, to tap into that market. Uh, I think the big thing for us is uh, there was never any doubt about what the players were going to be able to showcase. Uh, I think that was that's a you know been a consistent. Uh, thing that's occurred for our game is the on-field product. I think it's everything that's around it and how do we promote the game. And um, I think the b best thing that's come from it is that, yeah, w our players were able to showcase just the, the skill, uh, the authenticity they have, the diversity in size, speed um, and whatnot. And, uh, but I think now it's about, you know, what is the strategy and then how do all the stakeholders plug into it to really capitalise on what a great game we've got? Yeah, um, just just from your position, uh, you people go, oh, it, it was criticised from everybody. But I think mm. uh, yeah, when you hear the story of halfway through season 2023, season 2024 is going to kick off in Las Vegas, mm. you go like, Come on, what planet are you on? How and when did you receive the news and what was your sort of initial reaction? Well, it was in the cut and thrust of um, our dispute. Uh, so whether it was strategic or not, you know, I don't know, um, as a, def you know, a, a, a way to deflect attention away from what was going on. Uh, but, yeah, we found out about it really like everyone else. Um, again, we were, we've never been against uh, expansion uh, and taking the game to uh, places such as the US uh, and providing opportunities for people to see what a great game we've got. I think it's more about, you know, what's the strategy? Where do players fit in here? Because ultimately they're the ones that are there to play and promote the game. And so therefore we've always been of the view that if you include players up front in that process, it's far more likely to be, you know, successful or hit the hit the notes that you want. Yeah. So it, it, it came in, in the mink in the mixed in the in the in right in, in the midst. <laughs> in the midst. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> in the midst of quite a fiery played out in the public collective bargaining agreement negotiation. Um just firstly, that's all done and dusted. The long form is now signed. Yeah, it's a obviously a historic moment for the game, you know, to have a, a long form that captures both our male and female players, NRL and NRLW. That's never been uh, done before. Uh, it's it's something that we really need to hold up and be proud of. Uh, it gives us some great foundations to move forward on, and you know we're uh, you know I couldn't be prouder of the playing group. Uh, in the way in which they saw the importance of this, what it actually meant, uh, not just for today's players, uh, but for past and future players, because uh, there's some significant things that we've been able to secure. And uh, I think now it gives us a great opportunity to just move forward collectively as a game, because I think we need to. There's been some pain. Uh, there's been, whether you call it a war, dispute, um, whatever, now it's time, heal, come together, move forward, let's really um, show people what we can do. Yeah, well, you know, I've lived on both sides of the fence. Mm -hmm. I've been part of a game in the Super League with no collective bargaining mm -hmm. agreement. And to be 
completely upfront and honest, I didn't know such a thing existed, mm. really. I sort of heard the term banded around mm. with American sports and coming here to Australia, um, obviously we had a, a, a players union, which I kind of didn't really know what it meant. I, in England, they sort of have one, but it's not solely for no. the players. And I think you know, that was really exposed during COVID. Yes. I, I moved competitions from the NRL to the Super League and heard tales where you know, it wasn't the collective no. of Super League like it was with the NRL. We all took in the NRL agreed mm. you know across the game yep. pay cuts where back home in england it was each club and then each player would be up to their own self to negotiate yeah. and then and then even now with some of the refereeing decisions that there's some rules put in place designed to protect the players but the mm. players are re rebelling against that and saying well hang on we don't want this and mm. you know talk on twitter of or x as it is now known we should time to form a players union mm. time to bring our voice i think you you rely on these collective bargaining agreements when you really need them and you can almost take them for granted a little bit well it's difficult right because the english uh or the players that come through the england system the irony is unions in england um just like this country of the are the backbone of the community uh you know we, i think we saw we, we saw what COVID, the positives and negatives of industries without representation and collective agreements in place. Those that were on contracts, individually, you know, individual contracts without representation, without the protection that, you know, a, a union or an association provides were destroyed. You know, it was every man and woman for themselves. That happened in the Super League, just like industries here during COVID, um, where people were obliterated, you know, because of the fact that they didn't have that collectivism approach, they didn't have that protection. To think that individual clubs were negotiating um, with individual players or collective players at that club what the cuts were, um, you know, you're, you're basically at the mercy of your club. You yeah. know, um, just like other industries. And, but it's all Toronto and, go, know, on, go and, under. No, so. So again, but you also don't know what you don't know either. Mm. You know, so I've been I've been a part of the association since really 03, where I was on the board um, as a 22 year old, um, and Tony Butterfield stepped into a space that was really non-existent. Um, really, the the association uh, had been going for you know uh, 20 odd years at that point, um, but uh, it was not in a position where players uh, felt like it was a proper representation of them. Now it's a chicken and egg situation where if you don't buy in, if you don't, you know, pay, then, you know, um, how do you actually resource? If you don't resource, how do you actually get momentum? How do you get progress? So again, when I went to, when I saw the value of it, you know, I, you know, our family was sort of a, had a strong background and connection to unions. Um, based on my grandfather and and his father, um, in the mines in in Newcastle when they shut down the mines and kicked the workers out, um, and be the be without pay, you know that dead set would you know put people in a situation where they couldn't put food on the table, like for my father and uh, and my auntie. So that was one of the reasons why you know they left the 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 Cessnock region and the Hunter Valley, and he became a police officer here, my grandfather. So. So there was a, a strong tie to it in England. Again, after seeing what it was, able, what we were able to do in two thousand and three, when we secured the first ever collective bargaining agreement, and we got wellbeing education in place, we got minimum wage, we got insurances, you know, those types of things that had never been introduced before that really protect bottom up. Um, I remember going to a meeting in um, Huddersfield, of all places. Um, where league was was um, founded, uh, and the irony of this is right. It started in England based on workers' rights, based on rugby union not protecting you know their players, and not paying workers' compensation or not compensating for for players that um, that got injured whilst playing that then were off work. So rugby league started in England for workers' rights. It's the only code in the world that started because of workers' rights. You know, um, 
And so that's kind of special, right, you know, in my view. But then England never picked that up. You know, there was something happened there where then they moved away from what they actually started, um, what the game started on. And I remember being in England, no minimum wage. There's still, you know, no real protections for players on minimum wage. You know, that's a whole other topic. But, you know, again, they don't have a collective bargaining agreement in place. I remember going to that. There was two players at every club um, that were there. I think your representatives were John Wilkin and I um, uh, can't think who else, but there was, you know, um, Lee Breers and Stuart Field and then Jamie Peacock and I think Kevin Sinfield and myself and Ben Gallier and um, every club was represented there and we, we were trying to get, you know, the association off the ground. The reality was, James, which was probably similar to here in this country, um, it was very, you know, dog eat dog. It wasn't personal, but people weren't aware because people weren't talking about the issues. If you were getting paid here, you didn't know, and you, nor did you probably care to a lesser extent what those people at the bottom end were, were getting and, you know, the way in which they were, you know, really getting screwed over by, you know, um, in individual situations. But I remember saying to the players there, because obviously over there you'd have banter and you'd be sledging each other on the field about, you know, you're taking our jobs and coming over here and whatnot, <laughs> which is which is all part of it. Um, and as I said to the players in the time in that meeting, well, you know, you bang on about us taking your jobs, but what are you doing as Englishmen to protect your most vulnerable, which is the players at the bottom? What are you doing, you know, to help them? If you don't get your act together and you don't actually come together and form a strong union and a representative body, then stop complaining about your terms and conditions. And that's really what happened here in Australia. Like Tony obviously, you know, got up and did it. And then, I, you know, I've, I felt like, um, you know, after playing in England and seeing that, coming back and seeing where our association kind of had got to, um, you sort of felt like there was this moral you know, an ethical responsibility to get back involved because you had such a deep conviction for why this is important, not for just players, for the game's progress. Look at where the Super League is, you know, and look at where our code is now in this country. And I do strongly believe it is uh, a big part of that is through the lack of representation because in my view there is um, players have been or athletes globally you know, often are the philosophical and moral compass of the game. Park, you know, what goes on outside the game, but where the game, because they're all fans, they started as fans, they end up as players, they're still a fan. Yeah. You know, so they, they come from there, you know, and that never leaves you. And I think that that's the important part of it. Yeah, you're right what you say there. I think the players, you know, you can get lost in the player mentality and a little bit in that bubble. Um, but we, I did love the game. I still love the game. You know, I, I love competing as a player. I think um, it can, that can get lost a little bit. Um, but I think the a couple of things you said there, it, it's better for the players and it's better for the game mm. overall mm. with a strong association and strong representation. Yes. I think some of the thing that the issues that happen in England, it's um, one is cost. Everyone thinks it's a great idea. But then, when it comes to taking a percentage of your wage, the, that's where the, yeah. the, the that's where fundamentally I've seen yeah. them, them shit themselves, and it's. But there's it, a strategy in place around that, right? Like, well, you know, again, exactly. one of the one of the biggest moves that us as players made in in 2012 was at our AGM, where we were in some trouble financially. Uh, there was 80 odd, you know, not 100 players at the our AGM. You know, it was unheard of, but we were coming in by the bus loads. Um, I was there at that and yeah, I, I kind of didn't really know what because, was going on. Because it was very important at that time um, in 2012 to say, right, like this is a problem. You know, we need representation. Um, and, and the decision that we made was that when we get our collective bargaining agreement over the line, there will be 100,000 that would come off the salary cap uh, that would go – otherwise to players that would go towards funding the association. So it would be redirected, otherwise would go to the cap, which is player money. Well, Jen, not just you know, player, basically the top player at yeah. this club. So, and that 100K really. was really, yeah, agree that 
the top players were ultimately going to sacrifice that yeah. because let's be honest, that 100K would have otherwise no doubt gone to the top three or four. That went in to fund the association. It's player money. I know there was some rhetoric around, well, you know, clubs fund us or, you know, the game funds. No, no, no. It is player money that we negotiate, that players choose. We want that our money to go there. And instead of going from NRL to club to player to association, yes. it, it skips that yep. taxation and all that. So it's, just a, it's, it's more direct yeah. from you. Then you're not chasing up 30 players times 16 well, or 17 not, as it is but now. But it's also not it's it's not the way um you know player associations globally operate you know because uh, again we've got a small membership this isn't a you know 20,000 person membership like some of the unions in this country and 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 more abroad so you have to work through that and ultimately what that did was that 1.6 million that then came in to fund the association it gave us 5 years to build we'd never had that before and if you look at the progress that's been made since 2013, in 10 years where our game is at with regards to the terms and conditions, the, the, um, the payments to players, um, the revenue generation that the game is getting, where the, the NRL obviously um, pleasingly announced that it generated you know, over $700 million last year, record. You know? So that, that is a clear sign that the game has progressed forward. They are record numbers. And in my view, if you've got a workforce, in our case players, that feel like they're part of the game, they're being respected, they're protected, their workplace and their work conditions are conducive to high performance, then you are going to get more out of that person. It's no different to every other industry. If you're going to treat your staff like shit, chances are productivity is not going to be great. Well, it's going to bubble. Like what's happening in the Super League yes. to an extent where issues are arising, mm. they don't feel like they have a voice, there's mm. a level of frustration there and you know, things could potentially boil over or an unorganised strike, an unorganised media boycott, mm. whatever it may be. So I have no doubt that the, the CBA is, is very important and, like I say, treating the workers, which the players are fundamentally, um, w with respect and feeling like they have a say. Because, well, to be fair, you'd want to make them feel like that anyway, but they, can, they actually know some shit. Oh, well, like, they're, yeah. they're smart people. Well, I think where they're... Where and they I'm, care. They, they, exactly. they care about the game. And where the players are right now, mate, I mean, again, it's another reason why I'm so passionate about, you know, the, the, you know, the playing group is the fact that we've never had a more... Um, educated or engaged group of players in the history of our code. You know, that's, in my view, that's worth promoting. Mm. Um, they actually genuinely care about each other. Yes, there's going to be issues that pop up, player v player and whatnot, you know, but they, you know, particularly our elite players um, have chosen to, you know, do, do various things to ensure that our minimum wages are there, contract security is there, investment in retirement account, investment in funds that have never existed before to help our past players. That is coming off, you know, from that is coming from the revenue that these play, current players are generating because they see that as important, paying back, you know. Uh, and, and again, every fund that has been established in this game has been a fund that players started. Wellbeing education, retirement account, injury hardship, medical support fund, now the general hardship fund, these are all, you know, really philanthropic funds that started by players. Yeah, because it's their slice of the pie. Yes. Fundamentally, with they they're giving up. Oh, and, and gladly, well, yeah. and, and pleasingly, the NRL, you know, uh, and, and which obviously started in 03 when we got our first one. Yes, there's you know there's there's conflict and there's um, uh, there are some challenges there in in convincing them at various times of the importance and obviously. Um, and, and, and how it's going to be governed and managed and, and I get all that. And pleasingly, we are in a better position. We are in a good position because the, 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 the offshoot of that, if the, if the game doesn't buy into that, we don't have it and people suffer from it. You know, so again, that's why the CBA is important um, that the game you know, saw the, the importance of that. Um, yep, had to 
had to fight hard for it. But ultimately, we, we got there and that's something that, again, I think us collectively, playing group, game, clubs, everyone should be proud of. Uh, and also, I think for, for the, the intelligent listener out there, there's one thing that you've not really brought up and that's salary cap because it's more than just mm. the salary cap. And mm. I remember you know, thinking, why, why is this taking so long? The salary cap's been set, mm. but there is so much more that goes into yeah. it. We were thinking yesterday it might have just been, well, it's the cap sorted. Well, mm. that's it, we're done. We don't really need to worry. But these other aspects, they are important. Well, I think the, the, the challenge for our game and for players was to understand you know, um, historically, yes, players have probably gone for more um, because of the life, you know, the life expectancy in our game where the average is 40 games, you know. So when you're looking at that as a three, four, five-year career span, um, players have historically gone, well, let's take the cash up front. Let's look after ourselves financially because we aren't here for long. That's the reality of it. That's the mindset um, because the time horizon is – so short where our, where our players have got to now because players are you know paid well and they're you know they're better protected and supported in that regard minimum wage has gone up you know um, significantly in the last few years which is great um but you know the, the important part was where obviously you know a big part of that was when the linkage to the unions and whatnot you know uh, last year was you know rights are rights money's money you know you get paid what you're worth based on what your contribution is and the importance of your role in generating that revenue. Rights sit here. And I think for too long our, you know, players have sort of, I suppose, been bought off rights. But I think we'd got to a position where financially, you know, players were, you know, content uh, in that space. It was this deal was really much more about rights and protections mm -hmm. Uh, and, and autonomy of the RLPA um, and the women and making sure that there were protections there and the investment, the necessary investment there. Um, so that, that's why this one was quite different, which was always going to be a challenge. This is why it always took, it took much longer because I think it was much more complex um, and, and there was a, you know, for a whole other re range of reasons, but uh, it, it is now we have a comprehensive... Um, uh, and well-documented CBA that people can point to with certainty now. Well, I'll, I'll come back um, to some of the issues um, that we faced in, in getting this CBA um, mm. signed and where we may look to the future and some of the points uh, of conjecture around that. But I think as well, I, th I think back to my time in England where we would play Good Friday... <laughs> Easter Monday and the following Friday. So three games in eight yeah. days, which, you know, we I grew up with that. So I didn't think yeah. any different. And then uh, I don't know if it's still happening, but a couple nah. of seasons ago, they bought in the, the Easter weekend still happens, yes. but they bought in a second Easter style yeah. weekend where teams would play yeah. randomly. I think on the long weekend yeah. bank holiday a Friday, a Monday, and then a Sunday. Yeah. And, and it just got brought in and the players were, like in shock, like you can't do this, and the league are like, well, we can because you, you you're not going to get your no, no. they they face no opposition. But yeah. if the NRL turned around and said, hey, I know this, well, we have a minimum five day turn around now, yeah. but if, if if that wasn't in, the league could technically do that and say, get Absolutely. on with it. Well, and that was one of the things that we you know fought hard to protect was you know the the ability for um, the game to introduce even one match you know yeah. into the schedule. Uh, without agreement, you know. Again, we, you're playing. You know, arguably, it's the longest, you know, uh, team contact sport in the world. Um, it's no different in England. Uh, one of the issues, obviously, in England was, you know, having experienced that firsthand, was like, by the time you get to the end of the season, the squad depth is so small that the chances of injury are so high in that season that by the time you get to the end of the season, you actually don't have that um, that high percentage of your best players playing because they're they're busted, they're injured. You're not actually performing to the best of your ability, which actually damages the product. It really, uh, you know. And I think uh, the the 
high performance environments in England are not where they are here. I think, you know, players here are fortunate that obviously centre of excellences have been a really, you know, important move both from government and um, and in local areas for community uh, and revenue drivers, which is league, you know, in, in a lot of these communities. Uh, but again, I think self-interest got in the way of England. Uh, in, in my view, I think some of the powerful clubs were like, well, we're okay because as long as we're winning championships and we uh, and we're getting our sponsors and we're getting you know uh, prime time TV and all that, then we can we'll be okay. The issue was, which I'd raised with a number of them over there, is that if you just worry about yourself, these clubs are going to die on the vine and they're going to struggle, and therefore that will have a knock on effect with the quality of the product. And, and again, my view is that why would an English kid, you know, hang in there and go, you have to be bloody resilient and you did it, right, to get through winter, training in winter on 5,000 pound. Yeah, it, it's Like how shocking. do you do that? Like, you know, 10,000 pound. Like that, you are relying on someone like their conviction and their commitment so much that they're going to say, I'd rather play in championship because I'm going to get a trade. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to better get, quality you know, of life. I'm going, yeah. to, you know, I'm going to work and play. I'm probably going to get double, triple, quadruple more than what I would mm. in the Super League. Uh, and I think there's been some fundamental issues there that they've, you know, really forgotten about how important that is to the pipeline. Um, and, and I think that's had a big impact on, and I think that's the, that's the byproduct as well of having strong association, you know, um, game buying in because at, at every point you have to do a deal, right? Mm. So the game has bought in and done and done deals, you know, with players in the last sort of twenty years to get, you know, our fifth, you know, um, our fourth, fifth CBA in place. So they play a role, obviously, in accepting that is important, you know. But minimum wage and all those other things. If I'm a if if I'm a parent, which I am, you know, a father of three girls. And my one of my daughters or all of my daughters want to play in the NRLW, then I want to know that when they play there, they're going to be protected. Yeah. They're going to have those, you know, those standards in place. And I think that really rang home for me, you know, in our in our disputes uh, over the last sort of eighteen months is just the parents coming up in England during the World Cup um, from different parents from different nations, you know, and you're just sort of walking around with my daughters and and whatnot and. They're saying, you know, don't, don't stop, you know, mm. because of the fact that um, I want my son and my, I want my daughter to have protection. Mm. I want them to be looked after. I want them to, you know, to, to feel like they are protected. And I think that was that, – that's something you don't think about in the heat of the moment. You're not – you sort of sometimes just got such a narrow focus and a laser focus on getting the job done, you know, for, yes, the players, mm. but then when you're getting the outside influence like that we go – shit this is so much more than yeah it's just here yeah it's huge um like i said we'll we'll pop back to the cba a little bit later on but i want to get into your story because you come from a very famous uh sporting background Mm. born in america Mm. uh to a pretty handy uh father at golf well a pretty handy golfer as a father yeah and an english mother and an english mother as well oh that's how you had the british passport passport, yes yeah what was life like growing up with um, with that as your set of circumstances? Yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly fortunate in a lot of ways, one, to even have a father, um, you know, after what happened with his accident. Uh, but, you know, how I was born in the States was he was over there, you know, playing, uh, preparing for the US Open. Uh, they spent time in, you know, in Africa, in the US, in Europe, in Australia, playing in the different tours um, based on which tournament he was on and what tour he was on. They had bases, obviously, in the in in England. Mum coming from Dulwich in London, um, and um, and Dad obviously Hunter Valley, um, Cessnock boy. Uh, so they were based. We were based in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, um, and that was where I was born. Um, Mum didn't see Dad for a couple of days. Probably not great prep going into the US Open. Um, but, uh, but it was, uh, we lived there sort of on and off for the first, you know, 
couple of years and then um, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way, you know, we look at it, we look at it as fortunate. Um, that's the only way I think we can look at it is dad had his accident um, in, in 83 and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we were close to losing him. Uh, the, the fact that he was able to survive and, and, and not, well, I suppose not just survive but go on and thrive and make such a significant contribution to this country and, um, and golf uh, and, and charities and foundations that this is established and, you know, um, and, and generated revenue towards. The, yeah, we, we, we moved back to Warners Bay um, and we started again, really. Uh, and my mum, obviously, she was so incredibly strong during that period because I was two, my, my sister was, you know, four or five. Uh, and the reality was, she, you know, we were, it was like having a third child. Um, because he, it, every, everything started again for him in a lot of ways. Um, you know, uh, learning, you know, how to ride again, learning how to feed himself, learning how to put his clothes on, you know, learning how to wipe his ass, you know, like just all the things that we take for granted. Yeah. Um, it, I had a front row seat to both via my mum and dad, um, what, you know, what resilience looks like, you know, what... Um, compromise looks like what uh, where you've got to just grit your teeth and just go nah not today you know we're I'm going to keep moving forward and dad was always very much like well what was I going to do what was I going to do sit in the corner and cry about yeah. it I had two kids that needed me I had a wife that um, uh, that needed a husband I needed to you know get my shit together and work out where I could make a contribution to be able to provide for my family and the alternative was what, you know, like give up. Uh, and so I'm incredibly grateful for, the, for, for him and mum for making that decision because it is a decision that they had a choice. They had a choice and they chose to go, no, no, we're going to move forward as a but, family. But it almost sounds like you, to, to, to your dad's perspective he didn't. Uh, and, it, and I hear this a lot with with people who are strong with resilience and especially built in football. It's like, why did you, how did you carry on? It's like, well, because that's what we do. Yeah. And when you're exposed to that mindset as a youngster, you take it as red. Mm. Like it's just, pardon the pun with the golf, part, part for the course. Yeah, exactly. That's what people do. You just, oh, well, I'm becomes, just sit, oh, sit, sit and just feel sorry for myself. Now I'm going to get up and go and do something. Well, it becomes a like a, it's that's your staple diet, right? Yeah. That's that is then it deeply ingrained into your DNA, and I and I look at our players today, and you know they, they a lot of them are coming from a long way back with their own stories and their own um, challenges. It's again, why I'm so proud to represent them, um, because they're a representation of society and community. Uh, and for me, um, yeah, it was it was difficult because of the fact that you're watching. At times, you, you know, your mother and father struggle to deal with, you know, when you are at the top of your game in 83 when he was, you know, arguably, you know, one of the best players in Europe. You know, he, he was only, you know, fresh off the back of, um, uh, you know, Masters and British Opens um, and whatnot where he's going head-to-head -head with the world's best and beating them. And in one sort of, you know, blink of an eye, your career has gone uh, and you've got two kids to support, you know, which I think was his saving grace really, which he, which he openly spoke about. I think if he, you know, he sort of says, well, you, if, if I didn't have my kids, would have I made the same decision? Now I probably think he probably would have, but at the same time um, it, it puts a different lens on it and and then you know rehabilitation came back from septicemia uh where he was you know you know effectively dead on the you know the table um so uh i think that he i think my father was in my view epitomized what um makes people great in that regard mm. and uh and our country and and i it had its upsides and it had its challenges, you know, uh, where you are conditioned to, 
you know, maybe not ask for help. Like I never saw him ask for help ever. Uh, mm. I never saw him show, um, you know, emotion in a way in which, you know, where he felt like he was struggling or anything like that, which again is, you know, you're, that's how you grow up. You know, I had a mother that was um, very much around self-subjugation, putting everyone first and, you know, but she was incredibly strong and resilient and the rock of our family. And, um, but again, that's what makes families great yeah. because it's a story and, but it was, you know, we were exposed to a lot as children, uh, you know, at an early age, you know, when dad's coming out of the hospital and I'm two and you, you know, cameras are in your face, you know, the, and it's a story and everyone's part of that and you're on show and all that type of thing that comes with it. Uh, but you can use that as, you know, again, a, a, a vehicle, I suppose, to better understand how how the world works, listening to different things growing up. Uh, my dad having, you know, pretty feisty negotiations at times with Packer and Skase and, you know, Singo and uh, all the, you know, all, all the, you know, the power brokers. Um, and they gave him a shot, you know, he, they gave him a shot at, you know, being a commentator. He was the first disabled commentator, although dad would never see himself as disabled. I never saw him as disabled. I just saw him as dad, mm. you know, that's, that's him, you know, like yeah. I, I, you don't, because he never ever um, said, I can't do that son because of, I don't have my right arm and right eye, um, you know, uh, and I th you know, he's one of the big things that he was so terrified about in hospital was, as mum would say, is that oh, my mate's going to want to drink with me when, when I look, look at me. Um, and am I, you know, are they going to want to have a beer with me? Am I going to, like, are they going to accept me for this? Um, because obviously in your world back then, you're not exposed. You know, we don't have social media. You don't know how many other people are out there with different disabilities and different things. You are in your circle and he was the only person that he'd, basically seen that moves in his world mm. that now had no arm, no right eye, um, slashed through, you know, um, and, 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 you know, that was, that was, and also Kenny, Kenny hold a schooner and a, and a cigarette at the same time, you know? And so, uh, so again, that was, it was, um, that, that's as raw as, you know, you, you sort of get where you're going, like, am I going to be accepted? Yeah. Uh, because that's all anyone wants, you know, is that connection piece. And he was such a, you know, life of the party guy and so deeply connected and would get on well with a lot of people. It's why he was so close to Nicholas and, you know, Seve and, um, um, and Lee Trevino and um, Arnold Palmer and all the greats of the game is because they enjoyed his company mm. uh, and he would, you know, openly have a beer with people however he didn't suffer fools you know so uh if you if you're going to talk shit you know then you're going to have to be prepared to cop a spray from him or move on and go drink with someone else <laughs> and uh so which i i, I you know I, I like um but uh yeah i mean again he he gave me everything that i needed as did mum well you, you've got the two different sides of it there where someone's incredibly empathetic and compassionate you know, dealing with a guy that's just lost his career and his whole world in his space. And then you've got a guy that, you know, is incredibly gritty and determined, but also, you know, compassionate and empathetic because of what he's gone through. Um, so, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a, it was one hell of a, um, uh, an upbringing. Yeah, I bet it was. Was, was golf ever an option um, for, for you personally? I guess a lot of people would look to follow in their father's footsteps. We see it often in rugby league circles, obviously young uh, Tiger, with Tiger Woods and his son now. Um, mm. What about you? Did you, did no, you think I, that way? I or didn't. How, how, how did rugby league become a um, such an important part of your life? I think rugby league became an important part of my life because people told me I was no good at it. Um, and I think then that sort of triggers a response like with the way I was brought up. You know, that's what you see. Again, you're a reflection of you know, your, you know your, your environment and when someone says you can't do it or you're not going to do it or, you know, there, there's, a, there's a fire that gets lit inside you where there was knockers of my dad or you're not going to play golf again, surely. 
you know, dad gets down to single figures, <laughs> um, you know, with one arm uh, and one eye. Oh, you're not going to do this, hey? or you're not going to do like you know. Th- there was that consistent. Okay, well, I'll show you type approach. Yeah. And I think with golf, I think from a pure natural talent perspective, I, I was better. At, was much better at golf than I was at league. Oh, you were uh, better at golf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What um, the fuck did you leave so, it for? So, well, I didn't. I didn't like. I, I, the, what I loved. I, I what I loved about rugby league was I was exposed to it. Um, as a young child, you know, um, dad was originally a para supporter. He was close with Jack Gibson and, um, and a lot of the players, you know, through that, you know, seventies, eighties, you know, era, uh, you know, his, his father was Balmain. He was a, um, senior sergeant in Balmain, you know, start, you know, came into the cross and then moved, um, you know, when some of the, the, the ship was going down in the cross and, uh, moved over to Balmain. Uh, and he was, you know, he brought through Sir, you know, Paul Sirenen, um became close with Blocker and his family and, and whatnot. So it was always in our family. And obviously when you're growing up and, you know, when the Knights came into the competition in 80, uh, 88, uh, I was um, six at the time, you know, turning seven. And my father went, right, I'm now full-blown Knights. If they're going to be a team in my town or in, you know, where I am, Yes, I've got deep ties to Parramatta because, you know, he grew up around Epping and, uh, and whatnot. But no, no, that's it. Knights is my team. You know, he has, you know, he got his glass eye made into a Knights emblem <laughs> yeah, and uh, put the, the para, para eye in the, you know, in the container. L- and, legit? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so he... Well, hang on a minute. Like, in, like, so he didn't have an eyeball. He just had Newcastle night. We had an eyeball. But then your lens, yeah. you know, was he would take his eye in and out. And so you could put, obviously, the glass eye in. So he'd pop it in and out. And um, and um, it would have a Knights logo on it. Uh, or at times he'd, you know, have a prank and, you know, drop this um, eye in, you know, people's beer glass. <laughs> Uh, um, not only that, that, or he'd put in a drop in this one that says, uh, don't mind me, I'm pissed. Um, I, like, I, and then people would get to the bottom and, oh, shit, you know, like, you know, there's a, uh, so, um, so again, I, I think, uh, so, and our, because our family was so then heavily tied to the Knights, you know, my mum, I don't think she realised what she was getting herself in for when she, when dad came home and said, hey, there's this new team, this team is obviously there, we're getting in behind it, we're supporting it. Ali McMahon became very close with my family, um, the first coach. Um, Alan Bell, who was his right-hand man, is still, um, you know, one of the greatest minds of rugby league. Um, it was everything that Dad was about, you know, tough, uncompromising, um, had plenty of, you know, tomorrows. Uh, they could tackle, you know, the, all of those things that were sort of Hunter Valley, you know, true and true. Um, and dad said all three grades are coming over to our house. Um, you know, 21's reserve grade and, and first grade and mum was like, sorry, what? I was like, no, nah, nah, we need to bring them all together. You know, we're, we're bringing them here. You know, they, we need to have a beer. We need to have a barbecue. We're cooking like we're, we're on. This is when Robbie O was only 18. Like he'd only just come down, like 17, 18. Um, and these are all people like, you know, your, you know, Robbie McCormack's and your Bugsy Mullane's and Tony Butterfield and Jeff Doyle's and Ashley Gordon's and Gary Worth and, you know, all these, all these players, you know, uh, Haig, Sarge, Gavin Miller, Glenn Miller, uh, all these players and they all came and mum was expecting shit. Is this like, you know, um, a, a herd of Vikings coming into our house? Like what am I going to deal with here? And she was like so staunch from that point on because she was like, I couldn't have been more impressed with these blokes. They were all so um, respectful and nice and they brought their plates in and blah, blah, blah and all those types of things, which then that was, I don't know whether it was a strategy that dad, you know, put in place, make sure you behave yourself on the first one because I want more of these, you know. So, so, (laughs) so, um, but we would do, that became a family tradition, Mm -hmm. like where we would have players at our house, all three grades, you know, even when I then ended up playing first grade. So I think it was in my face more and that you became your idols. Mm. um, And, and I loved everything that the game provided, 
um, with regards to gave you an opportunity. It was a uh, it, you were, it was a leveling sort of experience. I love the collision. I, th- I just didn't connect with other golfers because of I I craved connection. I craved that community team environment, yeah. uh, and so golf didn't provide that. I think what golf obviously t- taught my father was you know obviously you know many traits that come in rugby league about respect and. Um, and, 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 you know, um, performance standards and accountability and, uh, and those types of things because you're only relying on yourself to perform. You don't have a team. Yeah. But I loved what the team sport provided and so, um, so you know, not, it was never against my father's wish. I never got pushed into, you know, any sport. We, we tried everything um, and he, um, you know, he threw a mean sort of um, – uh, one arm spiral off the ground, you know, um, and uh, and would play tennis and cricket and golf and swim. You know, he never swam around in circles. Um, most of people's um, uh, surprise, uh, but he. Um, and then I think you know I, I went. I played soccer. I was always very small um, as a as a child. Dad said you're not playing until you get to twelve because you're too small. Um, and then I went there and obviously. You know, that's when people you're, you're dealing with a whole lot of why are you playing this. You're no good at it. You know, your your dad's a golfer. You'd be better off doing that. Um, you know, you're you you shit at footy. You know, just give up. Um, you know, blah blah blah. And th- these are coming from fathers and that in you know around the canteen where all, all I want all I wanted was a can of coke and some red frog. Yeah. You know, like and yeah, they're, I don't need they're, your they're, they're giving yeah. life advice yeah. on. And I think that was that was part of the trigger for me was like right you know I'm going to show you, uh, and it, it, that I'm going to do this and um, and but everything is in your control at that point because ultimately it was okay am I going to you know what am I going to do am I you know, struggle and resistance and rejection from teams and you know not you know getting back in the day you know when people would be at your house and everyone's got their letter that they've got to say congratulations, you know, you've made it. I, I was the perennial thank you. If it starts with thank you, you're screwed. Um, and so uh, so I think that tra- that taught me very well. And then it was quite quick after that. Um, if I didn't get picked in teams, I'd always ask. That was always very mindful and mum were, were very mindful of the fact that there was a the stigma around if dad was ever too clo- like got too close to stuff, it was like, oh, you only yeah. got there because yeah. of this. So he literally would just step way back into the shadows in that space. Uh, was always forthcoming in you know in um, critiquing my game, <laughs> but uh, but it was he was very conscious of that. So I would then, but I, he taught me to say, well, if you didn't make it, go and ask him like why, you know, go and find out, you know, what, you know, ask for things, you know, you're never going to know if you don't ask, ask questions, you know, and that's what you do. You go, well, okay, I didn't make it. What can I work on? Can you give me your weight sh- program? Can you give me your training schedule? I'll go and do it. Yeah, I'll not do it willing myself. To accept, yeah, you're not going to accept yeah. that no with the yeah, first answer. I'll do so it I'm going to keep banging down yeah. the door. And I'll see you next year. Yeah. And then next year you turn up and you're better and they go, well, well, no, one, we didn't train this mm. bloke. And so... Then it went from sort of never making a rep team and making my first rep team at sort of 16, 17 to making my debut 18 months, two years later. Yeah, well, That's pr- how quick it can yeah. happen. You proved those people at the canteen wrong. <laughs> <laughs> showed you. <laughs> fucking showed you. <laughs> those red frogs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, you, you come through into a Newcastle team that mm. obviously it's got very famous uh, brother halfback pairing full of some superstars. Mm. Uh, what was it like for you? in and amongst the dressing room and then being coached by Brian Smith who, you know, ultimately um, decided to cut that dream of mm. staying at Newcastle short. I think pre-Brian Smith, I mean, my, my memories of Newcastle, you know, are, um, uh, you know, are, are full of many, many great times. So I was very fortunate to not only watch some great teams but then to play in some incredible teams with some fantastic players to to debut for your childhood team you know you've done that mm. uh it's there's something about that right yeah. you know, where you grow up and you're watching these guys you've been on think, the fence you've been on the wall you've uh, cheered them on yeah i think that's why kids 
I don't know. I think that's why kids um, love athletes because they athletes have followed their dreams, you know, and it sort of is a reflection of mm. that's where I want to be. So they love that. Um, you know, as you get older, you love the athleticism or what this person's about or the, you know, how in which they carry them, like that sort of stuff. But I think it begins with that that's I want to be that person clearly follow their dreams and that's where they are and I see myself which is why you have posters up on the wall yeah. I did you know you have all that stuff um and so therefore uh to then go into that play in front of my home crowd in front of my mates in front of my family against the Warriors in 01 out of kind of nowhere Michael Hagan sort of picked me um and to be playing with BK and Joey and Danny Badiris and Mark Hughes and Steve Simpson and Billy Peden and Matt Gidley, Robbie O, you know, um, all these players that I, many of them I'd idolised or I'd watched. And I became very close with Joey um, and, and, and many of the others, but, you know, sort of we'd watched his career and be, I'd, all the players that I'd played with, I'd watched their careers. I'd watched them every week. It was like a, it was part of our family's um bond was we would go and watch the nights every home game and literally nearly every away game and you'd debrief the game on the way home or me and my dad would get on the, the bus with supporters yeah and go down you know and then bus home uh and i'd have my, my he'd have his beer and i'd have my soft drink and you know bag of chips and that and you'd unpack the game on the way home um and that was us it was like origin like we would go to every sydney origin game you know, and just sit there. We were right behind Michael O'Connor's kick when he got it from the sideline. You know, we were there when Mark Coyne scored, you know, his, you know, his try. We were there when Guy and Lewis, you know, like that. So they, they are core childhood memories, you know, that is just so important uh, to, to me. So therefore to then do it is, is something really special and uh and so i had some you know six you know seven seven years at newcastle uh fortunate enough to um to be a part of the squad in you know, one when they won the comp you know um and um to watch even say someone like daniel abraham who i played with at valentine you know as a 13 14 year old winner comp you know is is awesome uh, and then we had some great success. We probably should have had more. Um, probably some of our professional standards weren't great, you know, at different times. Uh, but that was also the culture, yeah. you know, back then. But to watch people like Joey and BK and Betsy, there was a work ethic. What people didn't see in Joey Wright was he trained so hard, you know, like, and he instilled in a lot of us um whilst yeah okay he may have broken a few careers with his honest feedback and and whatnot but he made many of us he made probably way more than you know that he ever broke because he conditioned you to go if you want to have a beer you turn up and you train the next day and i always remember like if if we were out he'd say i'm calling you at six o'clock and you come you know be back in i'm going sure you will like when i started playing first grade or reserve grade and whatnot he ring the house phone. Mum would pick it up. Clean Joey's on, like Joey's on the phone. In I'd go doing hills. You know, at six in the morning after a game. You know, paying a tax. You know, for the beers that you'd had the night before. Yeah, that was the that was it. That was the mentality that we had. And um, and so I, I you know I you know there's many reasons why I love Joe. Um, not just because of that and what he. You know, we had our issues, um, Andrew and I, at times like where, again, I'd sort of stick up for younger players. He had a particular way of um, giving feedback um, on, the, on the field uh, in, the, in, the, in the heat of battle. Um, and, um, but I loved him for his brutal honesty and, and then what, how he went about looking after, you know, staying connected to my family, respecting my father and mother, you know, being there. Um, going and seeing my dad when he's in his home, um, you know, before he passed away, um, calling my mum, you know, on a you know weekly basis after dad passed away. Um, that's pretty special. Yeah. You know, and that's 
the part that people don't mm. see. In That's him. the bond, isn't it? Yeah. And the, the memories that are created. So that was so it was hard leaving Newcastle. Um, mm. uh, well, but, yeah, but Brian Smith m- moves you on. What, mm. what do you think was behind that? Uh, look, I mean, there's plenty of stories I could tell about that experience. Probably, I don't know whether uh, this is true or not, but it kind of turned out to be there was a mo- there was a moment uh, in 2007. Um, we're training. Brian, you know, was doing, um, you know, coaching. Obviously, this is in the preseason or um, close to it, and we're running opposed, and. Um, <laughs> And Joe runs a set, we used to call it a shark set. And um, so it was front row, drive it in to the inside shoulder um, of the halfback, get the prop also, you know, or back row involved. Take another one on the open but tight to get the markers involved or get the prop. But that then exposes the halfback again one-on-one mm-hmm. for the back row to jam it in. Um, so that was Steve Simpson on that side. I was on the other side. Um, I was on the left, Stimo was on the right. Um, and uh, I remember I think it might have been Walshy or something like that was was there and we'd go whack, whack, whack and then, you know, Brian just sort of stopped the set and said, you know, what the hell was that? You know, like what sort of set was that? And he was like it was a shark set and he goes, well, that is awful. Like don't play that ever again and Joe went, well, it seemed to work all right against you in 2001. Uh, <laughs> and obviously with Taylor and Butte, yeah. You know, there, oh, BK gosh. and Simo uh, played, you know, incredibly well and Billy Pete in, in that time and plenty of us laughed. I think nearly every player that laughed ended up getting punted um, from, from the club. Uh, Devico and myself and Bedsy and uh, Abes and, you know, others. Um, but, you know, I, I just thought sort of, it was a funny story that that was kind of like it was always tense and, yeah. Joey, that wasn't our team. Mm. This is a guy that came from Sydney that for whatever reason, you know, he'd been successful but not achieved success in the terms of winning a premiership. And he turned over lots of squads at Parramatta. There was a lot of churn, you know, which was not our culture. Um, Did we need some changing? Yes, we did. There were some things that needed to change. I thought our skill level that Brian taught, he was incredibly good at the skill of the game and the passing and the catching and all that that we that um Hags probably didn't prioritize but Hags was such a great man manager and got the best you know a lot of the time in difficult circumstances with um some strong personalities in Joey and BK and McDougal and uh and the like um and some complex thinkers uh so that Brian was very much about um keeping people on their toes and, you know, not making them think that they were something that they weren't and blah, 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 and, you know. So, uh, but I think, as you know, the game's hard enough without mind games. The game is hard enough without knowing, am I in the team or am I not in the team? What do you think of me? What do you really think of me? You know, and, you know, give me a reason, like give me something, you know, whereas Brian was very much like nearly every week, we played. Now I played the first. Um, uh, it was eight rounds or seven or eight rounds. Um, every week I would be told I'm not playing, um, and every week I would start. And I'd either be on the bench. He'd say, "You're coming off the bench," and then I'd start, and he'd do it the day of the game, or in the sheds, or you know, a, you know, two days before the game. Every game, and. And so what tension that created, and it wasn't just to me, it was to other players, um, it created this unnecessary tension and angst and uncertainty and frustration amongst the players. It was like, are you in? Am I in? And then and it was like, well, if someone then took my spot the day of a game, you know, like where I'm co- being called in, where I'd just been told I'm not playing and then called in and that player's now gone back to the bench or not even playing, there is that tension then that exists real or perceived we'd start to wonder what yeah. have they done to yeah. team what, what have they said yeah i mean we're training the day of the game like you know we train like game day, day of the game so i never forget the day you see yeah. you trained on game day yeah and because that's apparently what the premier league did you know like well mate we're not the premier league they're 70 kilo ring and wit some of those blokes we're 100 plus kilos that are 
going out and playing a brutal game. So, and you're turning up there with no certainty of what is the team. We'd roll out at Townsend, <laughs> Townsend Oval doing the, uh, you know, a, a game day team run. And blokes going, are you, are you on the right or the left? Am I here? And blah, blah, blah. And so you just, it, w- it was just so bizarre. And, and so Joey ends up doing his neck in uh, the, the, the week or Canberra. And then he does it at training. He's out for the year. Like he's gone. That's when his career is over. Um, at that point, around that time, we were running, I don't know, fifth or sixth. We, we were going okay. But – and it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's always caught me. But I felt like it was an obligation on me to stick up for some young blokes, to stick up for certain players in the team, you know, because I didn't agree with what was going on. And I saw the damage it was doing in the dressing room. Mm. Uh, and so – but – you know, it was – he just didn't want to listen and he probably saw that as, um, you know, pushing back and uh, and, and being um, – and not knowing my place and whatnot and we'd lost our, you know, obviously Joey. And then I played City Country. I got picked to play City Country with by Bellamy um, and um, uh, the year before I got ruled out with a f- um, blowout fracture of my eye socket um, – and then um, got an opportunity to play again the following year um, and came back. We were playing the, the Dogs on the Sunday. This is the t- days when you're playing City Country on the Thursday and then you're backing up, yeah. you know, and playing. So I, we fly back Friday, turn up for, for training on Friday, uh, you know, to do the team run. And I remember Brian just coming over and saying, mate, you're not playing you know, on Sunday. And back then, obviously, James, now times have changed. You just can't. It's not healthy for people to back up mm. like that. Um, and you're going, pardon? Like, I've just played in a genuine sort of origin sort of yeah. trial match, you know, when all the best players are playing in that um, at Coffs and you're denying me the right to continue a tradition um, at this club. Like, that's, no, that's wrong. Um, you can't handle it. You can't play more than 50 minutes. You'd never have been able to and just sort of all this type of stuff. And, um, and, and I said, well, what do you mean? Like, so I'm not in your 17. Like, and he goes, no, you're not. And so he walked off and then he yelled out, I'll tell you tomorrow whether you're coming or not. It's like, right, okay. So then the bus leaves at 2, about 1.30. I'm going, I haven't heard from this bloke. Like, is, he, is this a deliberate attempt to try and get me sacked here? Like, I'm going to turn up late for the bus and blah, blah, blah. I already had a problem with lateness. Um, and uh, so Bedsy, I call Beds. Beds calls me, um, says, oh, he's going to call you. You know, then he says, you know, like, you're not playing. And I said, well, I think I disagree with that. You know, I want to play. Um, I have an obligation to my team to play and to our, you know, and he said, you don't owe this club anything and... Blah, blah, blah. I said, yes, I do. You know, this is my childhood club. Like, I owe this club everything. And he's like, nah. Um, you know, you don't get it. You don't get it, blah, 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 and all that sort of stuff. And, and I said, um, what don't I get? And he said uh, that, um, you know, you're not looking at the big picture and a press, press, press. And eventually he goes, I said, what is the big – he goes, you know, you know, you're not in my squad. You, you, you don't you, – it's my job to pick the best team available and the best squad and you're not in it. And so I went, right, okay. So you don't want me to – yeah, like, you know, out type thing. I didn't play against the, the dogs. I got beat 40 nil. Not that I would have – you know, might have been 50 nil if I played. But, um, but they didn't – you know, we didn't play and um, – and therefore, um, I played the Warriors the next week, started um, in the front row. <laughs> and, um, and then I said to Simo and Bedsy and, um, and, and Gids and Dugs and that that were there at the club that we are, that I'm going to um, pull the pin uh, for these reasons. This is my 100th game against Brisbane. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. And at that point, I had no club. But what I'd found was English clubs were calling me and they said, you know that you, we're being offered you. you oh. Know? And so I had a British passport. Okay. yeah. And so I said, no, that's, that's interesting. And so, like, that was part of it. 
And so I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. Like I don't want to go – one, I don't want to leave the club. Um, we were still going okay at that point in the season. We then played Brisbane and we're sitting in the press conference and, um, and you know, Brian uh, gets asked – by Brett Keeble and Barry Tui and whatnot, like, you know, this is a great, this is a child, this is a hometown boy playing, you know, um, for, uh, sorry. Um, All good work. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, this is, uh, my, you know, your childhood club and, uh, um, and Brian goes, oh, I love coaching him. You know, like it's great to have him here and great achievement. I'm just going, well, what is going on here? And so then we play Brisbane. He leaves out, I think, um, like Woolley or Perry. Steve Simpson gets rested. Badiris gets rested. Gidley's out, you know, but like just, um, you know, gives, you know, Mullo the captaincy. He was 18 or 19 at the time, you know, drops George Carmont. Um, flies in Cooper Vuna, no one had sort of ever met Cooper. Um, and we train the day of the game at Broncos. We end up driving around for half an hour finding this, you know, um, we're playing at two o'clock or whatever we play. It takes us half an hour to get this oval. Everyone's brains fried. Train, get back to the team bus, go back to, you know, go to Suncorp. Um, and I'd never, and I he, he would never play me longer than sort of sixty five, you know, fifty five, fifty minute, like because he said you can't do it. I'd done it multiple times um, prior to that. Um, we got beat seventy one to six that day, and I played eighty minutes. Um, <coughs> I got left out there for eighty minutes, and that was kind of like, and I'm glad I did to mm. be honest, um, because I wanted to be there to be, you know, because that's, you know, for better or worse, that's the role, and I'm glad I did. You know, I was out there, but. It was already – I already made the decision prior to that, you know, and, and then I got slammed. I, I – they, they said, well, you're not going. I told Chief after the game. They said, um, we'll talk to you tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. Crowey and Chief were there. Crowey was the acting CEO at the time and they wanted me to go to England. They weren't going to release me to go to any club I wanted. And at that point I had no other club. Yeah, England – was a possibility, but I didn't want to go. I was sort of going, I'm going to quit. Like, I just, I've had enough. I hate what this game has, mm. how it's making me feel. Um, I just think it's too much. Um, the impact it was having on me, the impact it was having on my, you know, my, my teammates and whatnot and watching that was just, well, not a nice thing to do. So I said that, um, no, 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 bullshit. Like, I want, I want to be able to go wherever I want. At the moment, I don't have... Um, anything guaranteed or whatnot. It's pushed back. I had to sort of threaten that, you know, if you don't, then, um, you know, th this is going to come out like the, the shit that is going on here. Is, and, but I will agree if you let me go, I will sh shut my mouth. Yeah. I will not tell anyone about what is going on here at this club. Um, and they said, okay. So I go out on the, on the, on the piss that night with Joey and um, Bedsy and uh, Kurt Gids and then I get a phone call from um, Bellamy at nine o'clock, um, you know, a dozen schooners in and um, saying, you know, would I, be, would I be keen to come to Melbourne, which I thought it was bullshit at the time and I'm going, oh, it's Craig Bellamy and we're, I think we're in the Kent, there's music going, like, you know, and, um, <laughs> so, and uh, so then... Um, uh, we, he said, but Clint, you have to, before you make this decision, you have to understand this is not my team and we have a leadership group in place and that was Mick Crocker and Cooper and Matt King and Matt Geyer, Dallas Johnson, Steve Turner, um, uh, Cam Smith, um, Jeremy Smith, those guys. Um, I asked them, did, did they want you in their team? And they said yes. And that's the only reason why you're coming to this club. That's the only reason why I'm offering you a chance to come to that club. Now, from what I'd just been a part of in the, the you know, the shit show that existed in the team, you know, to hear that, you actually feel like you're wanted yeah. and you're going to be appreciated. And, you know, it's not like, 
you know, I'll come in and give you a cuddle. It's just that to get the best out of someone, they have to feel like they are playing a role or they're contributing 100%. something. Yeah, that they feel you know, a bit, yeah, little bit of love. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, and so uh, I said yes. And he said, oh, great. Well, you know, we booked your ticket. I was hoping you'd say yes. And, you know, there's a 6.45 flight on Wednesday morning. You know, get on it. So, um, so I was like, uh, you beauty. And we, he's, at that point he said, well, we don't know what we can offer you. But we'll sort that out. Like, we'll you know, sort, yeah. So I think I got 20 grand or something to go down. I'd sort of fall when about 120 um, to go there. I didn't want to pay out from the night. So I just said, I don't want anything. I I'm just, done. I, I'm finished. Yeah. Um, now, hindsight's a wonderful thing, obviously, you know, because, I mean, you know, there's all those sliding doors, cross, you know, moments and you think – that's why, in many ways, um, did it need to happen? Where you, where you know, you had to leave Newcastle and you know to go and do things and see the world and blah 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 and and, and achieve different things. Yeah, you know, um, did I agree with how it was done? No. Mm. Um, so there is a difference between something that needs to be done and the way in which it is done. Um, but, you know, I, ha I don't harbour any resentment. I don't harbour any anger about it. I just disagree with how it was done. But similar to the way in which our family has lived our life is everything happens for a reason. And that, you know, for whatever reason, that that's the way that played out. It led me to the storm. It gave me the best, you know, several months of my, my career. That then after the, you know, grand final and winning, that led me to make a decision I'd said to Bellamy if um, if you guys can't sign me um, I'll go to England because I don't want to play against you oh um, wow and because of everything that that club had given me personally um, and how they made me feel was like uh, I do not want to play it was hard enough leaving Newcastle I didn't want to play against another club um, and offers came after particularly after we won the comp and and whatnot and I said no um, I've made a I made a commitment to Craig. Now, if I had said to Craig, "Can I wind that back?" He he would have yeah. said, "Yeah, of course." But my word was my word. Yeah. I said I I didn't I you know I wouldn't I didn't. Um, some of the clubs were like, "You're crazy!" Like, why are you do like you you know you you're at the prime of your career. You just won a premiership. Well, it speaks volumes, you know, really. Um, and I said, "Well, I just that's my word for mm. better or worse." Um, before. The, you know, I signed in England, surprising to me, the Knights wanted to re-sign me. You know, and so Brian had, you know, reached out through a third party that were near Seriously? me and said, oh, there's been a mistake and we want to re-sign you and, you know, we want to bring you back. And they went to Dad and uh, I was in Thailand at the time with the Storm Boys for our trip away and Dad said, well, I can't tell, I'm not going to, you know, tell you exactly what he'd say, but I reckon I can give you a fair fucking hint of what he's going to say. <laughs> You know, and it's 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 get you know mm. get f and so, um, but wait till he gets back and he'll tell you that mm. himself probably. Yeah. And that, and I did, you know, I said no, nah, like mm. I'm not going back there, like no way. And um and so, the like again, it was just bizarre, mm. like you know the whole thing. So yeah, then obviously went to England and that's where, it, yeah, yeah. But just on the Storm Premiership win, I, I think there's three stages to it, um, or three stages I'd like to ask you about. The first is. Is obviously actually winning it. You, you spoke about that and how it, it, it gave you these memories for li life and clearly um, a, a, a bond that is formed that will be with you forever. Now, obviously at the time, didn't know what was uh, about to happen. I believe in 2010, you're playing at Hall KR. Mm. We, we all witnessed the... the, the the me the melee that happened here, mm. um, the the betting market flipped, people are smelling you out, and then the Mel Melbourne Storm come together as a unit with that infamous yes. uh, press conference with Craig Bellamy fronting it with the pl entire playing group behind him. You're over in Hull KR. What is it like when you find out that this these premierships are going to be stripped? Oh well, I woke up um, and I got to training. This is sort of pre. I wasn't on sort of social media a lot of the time. You know, during that period, there was no Instagram. You know, what is now what a time know, X. <laughs> yeah. um, I wasn't on Twitter at that time. Um, I wasn't checking sort of anything. And uh, I walk into training. I remember it. it was like I walk into training, 
and Mick Vella, who's as subtle as a sledgehammer at times, is um, oh, and you know, you've lost your comps, like suck shit, and mm. fucking blah, blah, and just thinking and picture his voice. Yeah, there. here we go, like you know that that sort of stuff. Mm. And I was like, what? You know, like, and so I'm going. I got on the phone to my mum and dad, and I says, like, what? What's happened? And they've said, well, yeah, this has happened, and um, and I. Uh, like I just couldn't believe it. Like, and I said, if they come knocking on the door for the ring, you know, going to give, don't give them that, you know. Like, <laughs> and so no, 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 mum said that's in my undies drawer. They won't go there, yeah. you know. So, <laughs> and so, um, uh, and then I remember talking to Brian Carney at the time. who was on TV, and he said, oh, we, you know, wouldn't mind getting you on to talk about it. And you know, I was just in shock. Uh, obviously, um. Yeah, it, it was difficult because of the fact that you go, well, that was out of my control um, in and uh, and in my view, um, it was there was it was an injustice, um, you know, p- you know, particularly at that time where you're just going, well, ha- like I don't understand any of this. Did you agree like, with it? Well, it was difficult because I didn't have all the information, uh, so. Um, so there's lots of information that has since been documented and, um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's certainly an argument to say, you know, how that process unfolded um, and due process and, and what was uh, and how that played out and how that decision was made and whatnot. You know, I think that there would be much more careful consideration with a longer period of time, you know, provided um, to to land in a position um uh that's you know in my view that's if that happened now like that's sort of where we would be like well hang on you know step through the process make sure you've taken time you know but to have a decision that was sort of handed down to the best of my knowledge in the space of sort of 48 hours and you know uh, um you know is 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 difficult um you know again it, it doesn't take away from the feelings that you have about, you know, what you went through and what you endured and, and whatnot. And, um, but, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a level of sadness and mm. disappointment there um, because it's tainted. There's no doubt about that. But, again, um, it is what it is. Again, everything happens for a reason, you mm. know, for whatever, you know, reason that is. That's, um, that was, you know, that's, that's part, of, it's part of the story. So I guess uh, we've, we've talked about winning finding out and now in the the aftermath and the celebrations now it can be questioned by mm. some and it does get questioned by some around why melbourne continue to commemorate and celebrate uh mm. these achievements of, of yesteryear what w- what are your thoughts on that and obviously you've been part of some of those celebrations and how do you ever feel it maybe compromises your current role now as RLPA CEO? No, no, no. I mean, it was I, I. You know, it's my role is my role. You know, now um, I think you know again. Uh, everyone's entitled to their opinion. You know, that's that's everyone's. I mean, whether it's right or wrong, it's up for interpretation. Uh, it's. Um, I think that there is a strong bond with the players. There's a strong bond, you know, in the club, uh, and there's a there, there's a sentiment around, you know, not forgetting the contribution because it extends beyond just the the title, right? It, it extends to, you know, the the trainers and you know the the guy that fills up the the drink bottles and gets the jerseys and the parents and what they went through and you know the role in which they've played to give their child a chance to play to fulfill their dreams and go and do it now um but i i understand i understand how the sentiment can be yeah but i th- i think that you know um i, I think we're you know you, you it's like anything you're kidding yourself if if you think that you're going to be able to please everyone um uh, it's just it's it's something that uh, the club feel is important and in, in their in their history and their tradition you know um, you know there's it is what it is mm. you mentioned after Melbourne moved to England mm. and that's where we first uh, 
run into one another. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. What, 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 can I just ask, what, what are your memories? Because you spoke earlier a little bit about, you know, the Aussies coming over. and mm. I, I, I don't think I had a chip on my shoulder because I obviously was, had did. some great you teammates that did. happened to be Australian. <laughs> they, they were the okay ones. But, yeah, we had a... We had a few little running battles, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, I loved my time in England. Like, genuinely, it was, like, arguably the best collective four years that I've had in my career. Like, on so many levels. You know, the the the, the fact that you went from sort of Melbourne, you know, to, you know, Newcastle, Melbourne to Hull, and there was, there was an element of Newcastle in Hull, except it was sort of like 10 years behind um in regards to which was which which town was 10 years behind but in regards to infrastructure (laughs) yeah and and the fact that and it was because that they'd been forgotten about that you know england you know and the powers that be forgot about that town Mm. you know and it has a deep history in 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 its role um uh and it played and um, how important it was. It was one of the largest ports, you know, um, outside of um, outside of the South Port, um, and so so much trade comes through there. Um, in the war, you know, um, that was it played a role, and it just got forgotten. Mm. It did. And, it and, did. And in my view, it was it wasn't like a lot of northern yes. cities and towns. And and in my view, that's what I mean about it was behind because of the lack of investment, the lack of care, the lack of priority that was placed in that north, you know, that northern corridor, um, which I I sort of felt was you know new, that was Newcastle. Mm. You know, if you if you only if you th- if you said to Newcastle, what is Newcastle like? People would only see. Sandgate Cemetery, you know, and Hexham, Aussie the Mozzie, you know, because they wouldn't go inland. Sorry, they wouldn't go east to where the beaches are mm. and all that, which is probably good, you know, for a lot of reasons because it was sort of, you know, we had our own sort of paradise there. Um, and it's similar to Hull. Like, unless you have to go to Hull, you don't go there because you keep going north, you know, towards Edinburgh and whatnot. Um, but I just loved the people. There was everything that was good about people was the fact that they were hardworking, working class, they loved their sport, they had this deep passion and conviction for their teams, you know, KR and FC and Hull City. To think that a club, that a, a, a town that was really downtrodden by everywhere, you know, voted the worst, you know, most unlivable city in, you know, in England or whatever, to produce like three professional teams... That's pretty awesome. It says something actually. And, that doesn't um, it? I've never viewed it like that, but you're right because it does get a bad name. And it, it, I think it did get voted something yeah. like worst you know, city like to crime, live in. Like yeah. It was crime or you know pregnancy or blah 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 or whatever. So I knew I did my homework before I went to Hull, and when I tell people I'm going to Hull KR, they go, "You what? You know, you're going to Hull, Craven like, Park? You know, yeah, Craven Park." Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, um, but I saw something in it where I was like, "This is a challenge." You know, I saw the fact that I was at Melbourne, we'd won a comp. You know, you're going to a club that had, had a deep um, history of success, that hadn't experienced success for like 20 odd years. Uh, they got promoted in in 06. They stayed up in 07 in the um, in the relegation game. So they were sort of effectively, you know, second last, you know, where they finished. And Justin Morgan uh, and Neil Hudgel, the owner, has obviously been just so tremendous in, in, you know, his resilience and what he's been able to achieve now at that club and where it is now, where it's one of the strongest clubs in the Super League. Um, And they sold me the dream of, you know, there is upside. This is a town that if you can connect with the people... You know, the, you know, then there's there's opportunity here. Um, I remember doing one of my first, um, you know, articles whilst I was still in. I trained all pre-season with Melbourne um, before I went over just before Christmas. So I was, you know, I, I was in a good good place, you know, physically and ready to go. And I remember, you know, coming out publicly. This whole, you know, the whole Daily Mail is the paper. There's really only one paper there. And I remember saying, like, you know, um, you know, there's a bit of a new sheriff in town, and you know, the like the 
whatever's happened prior to now, like we'll finish above FC every year that I'm there, you know, <laughs> nah, you know, type, type thing. Because I just wanted to light a fire yeah. with FC fans and West Hull. But also I wanted the East Hull people to say, this is not some Aussie mm. that's coming over to take a wage you know, that a time, that, for, a time yeah. that was, yes, that was some of the stigma that was around. Mm. Um, I wanted them to know I'm coming there to work, you know, and when people go, oh, you're going to England, it was like, well, it's not a holiday. Yeah, I'm going there. I, everything that I had, at, everything that I'd had in my life up to that point with regards to the work ethic and the obligation and the responsibility and their personal accountability on how you go about your day-to-day -day stuff, I was – Taking that there, this was no, this was not going to be a holiday for me. Yeah. I was all in. It wasn't about going, well, I'm doing this to go back to Australia and blah, yeah, with the know, with a top you know, pension, all that or, sort of yeah. stuff, and yeah, the pound was strong and all that. But literally, <laughs> it was, it was no, no, this I'm, this, I'm all in here, mm. you know. And so for me, I remember the backlash I got from like, you know, you know, this Aussie coming over and telling FC people that. They're going to be coming, you know, lower than KR that had sort of been out of the Super League for 20 odd years. You know, I just got hammered when I got over there. But that was good mm. because that you're in, right? You're in. And, and you're sort of like, I want to be in this fight, you know. And, uh, and I remember one of my first days there, I went to um, the supermarket, um, Sainsbury's, and uh, I'm pushing my trolley down the aisle trying to understand where's – you know, where's the food and blah, blah, blah. And I see these two FC, um, looks like husband and wife, you know, wearing jerseys, which is not really a known thing in Australia. Like they wear their jerseys all the time. Yeah, like over yeah. There, you know, like, <laughs> and, uh, and so you see it in the streets all the time and they walk towards me and it's like um, the, wife, the wife, you know, the, um, says, you know, what the fuck are you doing on this side of town? And you know, walk <laughs> off back to East Hull and, you know, <laughs> you're red and white bastard. Like, and, and, he, and I just went, shit, like, you know, mm. what am I going to do here? Like, and so, and he's a big lad, you know, the bloke. And I was thinking, oh, I don't want news to spread that I've just, you know, kowtowed it and like, you know, whatever, particularly, you know, these FC people. So I just went, right. You know, and I'm like, you know, out of my, you know, out of not playing, you know, for KR and not wearing the red and white. You know, you shut your mouth, like, you know, keep your opinion to yourself and blah, blah, blah. And oh, you fired back. Yeah, and um, and so just, you know, you know, piss off or whatever. And the husband, the wife and that was just shocked and the husband went, fair play to you, lad. And like <laughs> just, you know, and pushed, pushed on and I thought, right, here we go. Like this, yeah. is, this is good. And then so I used that, right, to – I knew my history. I knew some of the greats that had played at the club, mm. like Roger Millwoods and, and um, Phil Lowe and Johnny Whiteley and Arthur Beetson and Gavin Miller, like the Aussies that had played over there. It was really, really important to understand the history there. Um, and, I, you know, that – that's was so every opportunity I got, it was pump up KR, downplay FC, but pump up Hull. Yeah. You know, like and it's quite refreshing to hear yeah. that, mate. Like it really is. Like I can't recall those interviews or, or things like that, but it it is yeah. important when an Australian oh, or a Kiwi or, or, or anyone from no, NRL goes over to the to, to play yeah. in the Super I'm League, so they treat it with importance. I did it like that. Yeah. You know, the, and derbies were special, you know, the uh, winning eight out of nine derbies. And, did you win eight out of nine? Yeah. And, um, and that's a great record. And so, so um, and going down to the opposition end and deliberately warming up in front of, you know, the, the FC fans mm. and, you know, and what, you know, like. Yeah. And, um, and the coppers are going like piss off like down the other end and you're going to start this. And but that was that was important. And FC fans played a really crucial role in making my time so enjoyable um, because it felt like you were a part of something. Much the ri ri rivalry, yeah. it, it does something to yeah. you. Like, and even the power of hate. Oh, I'm a big mate. believer in the power of hate. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, you and need conflict. Yeah. You know, and like, the segregation yeah. of the fans. Yeah. It's like th this is yeah. everything to the people. Yeah. And then it led me to, you know, we played you in round two. Um, I knew that, you know, that the club was an incredibly strong club. Matt Gids was playing, obviously, at FC, uh, at St. Helens, who's an absolute champion he is. of a man um, and such a fantastic player. And it, 
And we just got beat by Leeds at Headingley. My old man was over. He'd come for a month at a time, which was a battle in itself, like keeping him mm. out of the pubs with Phil Lowe and, 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 and the pints are big and the, you know, the, and the rums are, uh, are, are just as big. Uh, and so uh, he was there for that month, just got beat, sold out at Headingley. We come into you, I'm going, right, okay, you guys have got a you know, gun team, um, and your pack's good, you know, with, with Fozard, yourself. Um, <laughs> Lee, Don't say Nick Fozard's yeah, good. <laughs> uh, um, uh, is it Lee Hopkins? Gilmore. Uh, Gil, Lee Gilmore. Yeah, Gilmore uh, Johnny it? Wilkin mm. and Flannery. You yeah, know, were, your forward, were your forward back. Roby was your, your hooker. And you had a really good team, you know, um, Melly on the wing and, you know, or, or, uh, so – and I – Thought, right, you know, I'd heard a bit about – I wasn't going to pick on Fozard because I knew he'd take your head off, you know, like, and he had a long <laughs> history of um, suspensions. Uh, so I thought, right, well, I won't go after Flannery, you know, because of knowing him and then I don't know much about that Wilkin. Looks like a bit of a pretty boy but I'll leave him. I thought, well, James Graham's there and apparently he's, he's got something about him, you know, good player, lots of hype. So I remember – always say just kick off to him you know like and i'm gonna go after <laughs> go after you. and uh i remember uh, you know the kickoffs and that and um he had that right foot you know and so i think i just drove in and i remember having a head clash yeah with you and do. like knock i think you even knocked it on or like you knocked you would sort of semi concussed and i was like get that india like you know and so uh and then in the scrums i'd always try and pack in at front row on mm. your side and head back you know, like and <laughs> and so and then you'd be going oh, off off to you know back to you know back to you know you're a convict and blah blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, that's an allegation <laughs> <laughs> allegedly uh and so um and obviously i just love the sled i love the banner and the sledging mm. obviously around you know that and i'd go well you know it's not a great decision by you blokes to send you know your worst people to the treasure island like you know how stupid are you <laughs> you know so so uh so i just loved it and then and then i remember you know we'd have our run-ins and it became a bit of a thing mm. over there where our fans would see that and i wanted them to see that i you know that that meant something mm. and you're gonna go and pick someone and that's what it was about yeah. and and then you knocked me out at um St Helens, uh, off the kickoff, I did didn't time it right, and um and you stepped back into me, and I remember you just hit. The, I've seen the footage, obviously. All my family that were over at the time, my grandmother, <laughs> you know, at sort of seventy eight <laughs> or whatever she was, you know, um, some ex teammates were there, and I just it was literally sort of off the kickoff, and um and knocked out, and um uh, and and sort of got got up down again, got up down mm. again, and then I think you just sort of held me down. And said that you know just have it you know have a minute lad you know and uh, so but again you know back then it was it was you know now what we know now mm. you know there was um, but no one knew back then it know, was just it was just it was play just on then play on and get on with it and not remember and you know I'm really glad that the games moved on mm. from there I know you had your words to say at the time when you know I was with the RLPA as well as playing about you know the concussion and having someone sort of rule that you were unable to play and the shift that you had um uh but that was the man you yeah. you were you were voicing you were voicing the way in which we were taught mm. to do and that's who I, 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 needed make, to be. I will make the decision about mm. whether or not i am capable mm. um of playing don't yeah. tell me you know and and i remember that it was very raw from your perspective but it, that's i'm glad that there was someone advocating for that mm. because if you don't then you're not properly understanding what you're going to have to do to educate mm. inform there was mm. much more than education that was required well after people like yourself mm. that was saying so passionately about that it showed that this is not mm. a rule change that you just set and forget mm. this is consistent education that's required because we're mm. changing a mindset that has been ingrained in us since the time we started watching mm. the game. Well, look, not to, to, to make it about me, but my my justification was that was I, I felt I knew more yeah. than what what 
the, the NRL, the sports governing yeah. body were, were providing me with. Mm. I felt like I was educated enough on the risk and mm. some of the potential long-term consequences, which yeah. I was happy to engage in that risk. And and some of it, it wasn't just if I'm knocked out, I'm going to carry on. Mm. It's if it's a, if I'm on the borderline, mm. I'll make the call because mm. I know the 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 thing with the concussion is the thing you need most is honesty. Yeah. So I didn't want someone to tell me that I was telling lies. Or and yeah, I, I, and and also. A little bit about my upbringing and where I'm from. I quite naturally, um, don't respond well to authority, and I was yeah. quite anti-authoritarian in my mm. approach to to life. Like I, I didn't like rules being. But that was uh, consistent uh, with the playing group yeah. as well. Like that, our playing group is not now known for, um, you know being able to sometimes tolerate authority because mm. there's trust issues and there's yeah. issues that surround that and, you know, how people can manipulate, you know, their positions of power and influence. Mm. And, and coming those, from working and, class yeah. backgrounds, a lot of people from Liverpool, where I'm from, like, yep. they don't trust the police. No, but that was uh, but it was and, necessary. And, that, and that's the, yeah. the highest authority. Totally. Or, or, so it was always like, oh, don't yeah. you like, yeah, you know, not that I was a too bad a scallywag, but there's, you know, most people from Liverpool would have a... Yeah, anyone telling them what to do mm. doesn't particularly... I, I know best. And you know what? Maybe that was that was probably wrong, but it was no, but it, who it, I was. And it's who, more importantly, it's, it's who I thought I needed to be at the but time. But it wasn't wrong based on what you knew. Yeah. like And so there's a big difference. Mm. You know, so it was... Um, if you have been conditioned and not exposed... And yep, there's probably a level there that you're saying, well, you know, go and educate yourself. But mm. at that time, it's sort of like... You know, again, I, I thought that that's why it is important for people, you know, for players and whatnot to speak about how they, you know, think, feel, you know, uh, and whatever. Because if we're not creating a space, right, that people feel like they can speak openly and honestly mm. about different things, then you will have hostages in the way in which things are introduced. Mm. Hostages are a bad thing, you know, in my view, because ultimately, you know, they don't believe it. They don't want to support it. They will do everything they can, you know, to ultimately um, rip away at that fabric that is there to protect you and, you know, whatever. Um, but it's necessary that people are saying that because, again, if you're not saying it, you're not, you are, then you are not fully aware of what is going to be required to shift the mindset. If everyone yeah. just toes the line. Yeah, yeah. And just gets in line. Reluctantly. Then, yeah. You may not then get the buy-in that we've got mm. now where players yep. are self-reporting and they're doing it. Like, so there is a role there that, you know, that where I, I think that it was it was a challenging role and I know we spoke about it at the time, you know, when it was like, no, nah, mate, I, you know, this is where mm. we are. And well, it was difficult for me because I was still playing as well as doing that role. And, and something that to, to back myself in terms of those comments, I had taken myself off mm. during a game. And people don't want to talk about that. So, mm. you know, like Joseph Suali, he mm. in the semi-final last year against Cronulla halftime, mm. puts his hand up. I played a game against the Roosters before, I think it was before that. And I've said to the doc, doc, I'm gone. Mm. I just need to come off. Nobody's seen it. Mm. There was no video evidence to make a claim that mm. I would have sustained uh, a head injury, a brain injury, mm. was in need of a head assessment, uh, a HIA. Mm. It, but I made the call because yeah. I knew something was wrong yeah. or I felt something was wrong. I, th I think the difficulty was always that, you know, outside of just that we needed experts to determine that and is that the competitive nature of us is that in certain circumstances on various things, you cannot be put in a position where you are conflicted based on the circumstance of now. Like, because not everyone is going to do that. There are going to be times when you are in a position where it is, uh, no, 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 this game matters too much. Because that's how, yeah. that's it. You, there yeah. is an element of very much, and there's been a shift in mindset of players because of things that we've advocated for and NRL have looked to introduce as well around, you know, the 18th man and how that's, you know, used and not, you know, again, it's all part of the, the mechanics of protecting players, but you've got to put things in place to then allow the safety of players to say i'm out well, well you know, because if you just kept on yeah. eroding like it is a it's much harder you know uh, to and be also to players 
and most people they live in the moment they live in the now and you know i'm sure there's plenty of people that suffer ill health consequences Mm. or 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 suffering through through uh, suffering ill health that Mm. look back at decisions that they made Mm. and gone you know I probably wish I didn't drink as much or, you know yeah. what, I probably wish I didn't smoke and in, in, or look at sport and go, you know what, I probably wish I didn't carry on yeah. or wish I wouldn't, well, you know, in, it wasn't footy, allowed Jack, to carry yeah. on. But that's yeah. that, that's that's things catching up with you where, you know, it, the benefit of hindsight's brilliant, yeah. but we live in, at that time, people go, would you have it back? It's like, well, I can't. At and that also, point, I, yeah. at that point, if you flash me back there, I'd tell you to piss off. I yeah. want to continue on. I don't care if James Graham in the future suffers that i don't give a shit i'm in the now yeah and that's and that's again one of the reasons why it is so important to have a game that respects the representative body the representative body is strong enough to represent the collective to field those that you know some of that tension work through it educate understand take that forward to the game to understand hey there's some tension here like we're going to need to work through it because ultimately you know our job and the way in which the game is played, if you are not living in the now, unless you're a, a, you know, a Joey, a Thurston, a Cam that are thinking three plays ahead, um, if you're not living in the now, you can't do your job. Yeah. You know, if you're worried about maybe I'm going to suffer an injury, then you're not going to carry the ball as hard as what you are. Like that, that is the mindset of that. So it's not going to dive on that loose ball. That's why it's important to have people in positions that are, looking top down in looking long term that's where you know our, you know the role of the players association in in you know hand in glove with the mm. the governing body and, and clubs and whatnot must always look at the future because mm. it's it's part of you know it's part of our job to you know to look at things from a future mm. perspective and find where's the risk yeah. how do we mitigate that risk what are the opportunities um, to improve, advance, you know, uh, and whatnot? And, and, and the education it. and awareness piece, because look, there's people that ignorance is bliss, right? Where people mm. enter into things and go, oh, hang on a minute, what, what do you mean this has mm. happened to me? Like, I, if there's one thing I can take is the fact that I entered into it voluntarily and was mm. fully aware of the risk. And people may say, well, that's it. that's even more idiotic. Yeah, like, and I think, there's but. An ele- yeah. I, but I, I've got my justifications for, for why I did what I did and who I was. I'm not going to betray my former self and say, well, he was an idiot. I, I, I'll i die on that hill and pick apart anyone that wants to, to, to come at me well, for I, it. But it just it's just who I was. And I also thought that the mindset is very much is that we, we you know, you, it's there was a, there's a shift in education around. Mm. It's very hard to see. The, you know, uh, still today, the, you know, the, some of the, you know, for you personally in that moment to look at the long-term effects of the decisions that you make today when you're in an injury perspective and you would have done it, you played, played with broken broken hands, fractured eye sockets, yeah. broken scapulars, you know, torn medials, you know, all these things that you go, that's okay. Mm. You know, th- like I'm, I'll take that risk. Um, in hindsight, was it right? Well, at that point in time, it was yeah, you know, based you know, on the information that you had or that you were willing to listen mm, to. Yeah, well, you know, even so. that. So, you know, the, the shoulder, elbow, hand injuries that you may say to a player, say, look, if you want to carry on, mm. you're not going to be able to pick up your grandkids. Mm. Now, how is a player supposed to be able to process information about a person that doesn't exist yet? Mm. Or, I, I, or, or, you know, so far into the future where they go, well, will I even get there? Who cares? I don't I don't care about my grandkids now. I don't even know who they are. I don't even, I, I've yeah. not even had children yet. And that, so, and that again comes back to, again, the role of clubs and that around yeah. trust. So if you don't trust that people have got your best interests at heart, mm. you're not going to listen, you mm. know, to them. And I think the game's come a long way, made some really important improvements. They have. In a whole range of areas, not just in the, you know, the head impact and, you know, concussion, you know, space, there's more to do. We must remain vigilant. We must continue to ensure that we are, we're getting the best, um, you know, the best tech, the best science, best research and the best people um, and the collective minds of experts together to be able to ensure that we are staying um, 
ahead of this as much as possible mm. and, and, and on yeah. top of it as much as possible it's yeah. kind of it's a funny one um in terms of you know you, you play how much does the game owe you once you finish like how much responsibility do you have to take for your own health or how much responsibility should the game take for some of the health consequences that you could argue the game has contributed to not caused but contributed to and it's it's because we do get financially compensated extremely well for the most part there are some players from an era before ours that i think have dug the well that certainly didn't have the awareness and education that i think we should look to help and provide them with a level of care that i don't know if they have right now but how much it's a question I wrestle with around how much responsibility does the individual need to take. I've had this conversation with a few people, and he's like, an, an ex footballer, I won't or I'll keep private. And he's like, mate, no one gives a fuck about you. Mm. Like, it's, it's about time you stop pretending that they do, and no one's going to be there for you. You just fucking do it yourself. And I'm like, no, I, I mean, there, you make a good yeah, point. But I think there's an element of that's where there's some responsibility, both on the game and, and us as players. and whatnot is the is why some of these funds that have been recently established uh and and the um commitment to do more you know is important uh and i think that that's i think that's you know and i think you know i think the game needs to demonstrate and us it's everyone collectively needs to demonstrate that the the level of 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 care is also about what we do from now moving forward and um as well as retrospectively looking at things and and going well you know could there be more done answer those questions you know and work through it but yeah i i think that again is i don't think the game has ever been in a position where it is now where um player health and safety um is a priority um and it, is there more work it's to a do? Priority, yes, there but is. it's not the it, it 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 shouldn't be the number one priority yeah. because if it is, I don't think we have a game. But I, I think under the definition of the terms safe, I don't think you don't, you know, I, it's not it's no, not ever going to be there. Well, I think what we need to ensure is that you know are we doing as much and is the game doing as as much as it can? And look, that it's that's an all in approach and it's a much you know bigger you know piece. But I think there is absolutely. A desire to continue to want to ensure that um, that there is a priority placed yeah. on that. Like, do you want zero risk? No. Mm. And people may push back and say, "Well, I want to play a completely safe sport." And the question is, do you? Mm. Like, I would I would grill them on that because I don't think people do. There's an attraction to risk, especially with young people, especially with young boys. That and I girls. think and and girls, and girls but but. but I think it is personality types and there are sex differences, certainly with young girls, certainly with young people, but more importantly, young boys, is, uh, the majority of have that attraction to, 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 to risk. That, that's why yeah. fucking teenagers will hang off the back of trains. <laughs> that's why when I was a kid, I used to fuck around near railway lines, which frightens the shit out of me. It's like, what, what were you doing? But there's a risk that it's like, you flirt with, but obviously sport was a far better productive use of my time and has given yeah. me a, an amazing and life. Look, sport, sport. I mean, again, when you look at it, it is such a great vehicle for so many great things outside of just providing, you know, jobs and mm. remuneration. Uh, and I just, I love where, you know, our code and the, you know, and world sports going with regards to the inclusion of women in that space, as I said, having three daughters, the fact that they can look at um, women and be able to the positive role that model is amazing and, for and the impact, girls. and you don't realise it a lot of the time until you're in it. But you know, my children just love watching the Matildas and love mm. watching you know the NRLW players, and you know, um, and, and I think that's just amazing um, uh, because ultimately. Uh, you, you want everyone to feel like they have an they have an ability to make a contribution in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, let's fast forward 
Uh, your playing days in England mm. are numbered, finished. Mm. You leave the game. You come back. Uh, you you come back and, and play. But Penrith. let's back at Penrith. Let's fast forward to the appointment of RLPA CEO. It happens on a Friday. <laughs> Talk us through <laughs> what happens over the next yeah. three days. I mean, my my journey of how you know of um, the RLPA is obviously. You know, really, twenty years um, coming up to twenty-one years this year um, from '03, you know, to now. But yeah, I, I mean, I remember obviously um, my predecessor in in Prendergast uh, um, uh, left, or you know, um, wanted to pursue other um, other career paths. I didn't know whether I wanted the job. Um, uh, I don't know. There was something in me that was like I think there was also that level of you know like a lot of rugby league players when you're pursuing a career and you've got you know you're in a position of leadership and you know with with such um accountability attached and the weight of responsibility is that you've had this imposter syndrome type you know am i you know do i actually have it or am i going to mm. get found out as like because ultimately you're you're sort of conditioned by many different things to say well you're just a rugby league player or you're just a footballer and you're not and and again based on even what i just said before about girls uh and their ability to see other people being successful um of you know that they can mirror there's there isn't many rugby mm. league ex-players that are put on a pedestal that are in key leadership positions you know in our game and so therefore you you know you have that self-doubt uh and but i had some good advisors and said you know well when is the perfect time there is never going to be a perfect time uh if you're waiting for the perfect moment perfect opportunity to take that leap of faith you'll never take it and so you just go yep okay i'll go for it i uh, got the job um on the friday on the monday i don't know whether it was a sixth sense or whatever that's you know what i said about them taking the job um on the Monday, the, you know, um, the game's finished, and we get called. I got called into a meeting with um, some of the, you know, with uh, Todd and uh, Peter, and some of the clubs, and uh, some of the commission, and some government officials, and they just say, um, you know, it's over. Like the game is stopping. Uh, there was. This it, is it, round three of twenty. Yeah, it's twenty twenty. Yeah, and and so and. Not only is it stopping, we actually don't have really any money left beyond a couple of months. Um, was that is it is it was that very real? The possibility yes. of the game not being able to pay its debts, debts yes, and pay its players, yes, a, um, because there was a debt owed to the broadcasters. Uh, and um, clubs were not in a financially strong position at that point. There were many of them that were operating at a significant loss, the combined loss of, you know, um, tens of millions. Uh, and so therefore they were, you know, um, and any club that was obviously funded by leagues club money, shut down of, you know, various uh, um, revenue generating areas in that space as well. But, I mean, I remember sitting there just going holy shit you know like we're in some trouble here um and uh that they said oh this is going to sweep through it's coming from spain this is what's happened you know uh you know go home tell your families you know that buckle you know bunker down and sort of buckle up you know because this is what this is going to be you know you know a train wreck coming through um and and i I remember just thinking, wow, um, how how do you communicate this to players without sending a state of absolute panic? Yeah. Um, there, and how are we communicating? And are they going to trust what I'm saying is true? Because there's an element bond. of trust between does the game not have that money or are they just telling us they don't have that money? Yeah. You know, and do they, you know, all that – so there's there's so much conditioned thinking around trust and you know belief and um, you know what had gone on historically in our game and 
uh, and then I remember like, you know, there was, I mean, Peter and I during that period, we would nearly speak every morning, um, you know, at six o'clock in the morning um, or around sort of, you know, between six and seven or whatever. I remember being in my garage at times too so I didn't like wake up the girls and, and, and whatnot, um, talking about what's next and what are we doing and, you know, how do we, you know, how are we doing it? And we only did that two-month deal, if you remember. Um, and so we didn't, we did not do long to, a long-term agreement like some of the other codes um, where they said, well, we're going to do a deal now to secure the next three years. Mm. I had, you know, I believed in the game. I believed in our ability to pull together around, let's just do a two-month like two deal based on the cuts and then – the like you know the game let's you know the game the the view and the hard view you know you know driven obviously by Peter, but obviously with our support and us saying right we are going to go for this, but you're going to have we're going to have to ride shotgun the whole way because you're not going to get players to buy in to this given some of the things that were you know in the public domain and the fear and whatnot which was very real, um, and so. There was that element. There was a. It was a fair risk, you know, in Tate doing a short-term deal, but it paid off because of we didn't lock ourselves away to something that at that time was was players were going to get much less, and the support of clubs would have been much less, and so there was a short-term deal done um, uh, to give some certainty around that. You know, as I said, speaking of you know, Peter and I had you know, some challenging conversations during that period of time where, you know, yes, absolutely, there's a, you know, commission there that is acting obviously in the in the best interest of the game collectively. You know, um, every waking moment that you sort of exist in my role is that your job is to uh, um, advance and protect the player's interests uh, whilst also having a lens on the game as well and what is the game's you know what how does the game survive uh and that's why it is so important in that relationship to say well the game is obviously going to look after the game but without the players uh there is no game without the fans there's no profession so again that they all must work together you know and clubs are so fundamental in that space as well because they're the the vehicle on an individual player level but I mean, there was many, many challenging moments, um, and uh, but I was really proud of our game. About in that, in that time when we needed to come together for a collective benefit, um, and not just game benefit, community. Like I've never seen it more important when your mates, where I live on the Central Coast, and they've got nothing. You know, work stopped, shut down, not paid can't do this you know and they're desperate to watch some sport, sport. because that is their escape that yeah. is their that is their window to you know a place that is not their day to day you can just forget and um and that was really sobering for me around that where my mates on the central coast with, with without them you know obviously my family were critical my wife and everyone you know the, the stress and the anxiety that you go through and the, the the back and forward and some of the, you know, the the rhetoric that gets, you know, that, that obviously um, people run, you know, greedy players and, and whatnot. And, you know, you were obviously playing at that time and a really, you know, important leader uh, as well um, in holding me accountable and us accountable about, you know, what deals are you, do, you know, doing and why are you doing it and explain that. And um, because, you know, we're like everyone else, we want to make sure that we're protecting our lot and it's our job to sort of strike the right balance between not um, putting the foot to the floor, you know, um, all the way at times, but understanding that um, this is having the long-term like, lens on it as well because, again, players are absolutely living in the mindset of the here and now. Um, and that's why our role, you know, one of the reasons why our role is important. But without my friends in that space, not only was it a motivator, 
um, outside of obviously the fundamental motivator is the players who you are there to protect and advance their interests and, and support them. But seeing the impact that it was having was just, you know, well, ultimately, as we know, it's been catastrophic yeah. in, many, in many ways um, what has happened, you know, from some of that, um, the shut, the lockdowns. and who, Whose call was it to shut the game down? Like it was the health authorities. The commission. The, the commission made the well, call. Well, they were basing the call on their well, the expert advice that they from received the health, from the government health authorities. Oh, and you know, I think it was uni- I think it was like health advisors and whatnot. Um, so I think Peter's publicly stated, you know, that probably if they had the time over again, they they would have they would have they mm. would have just ploughed forward um, with obviously the protocols and whatnot. But I mean, again. Hindsight's a wonderful thing mm. and at that time, you know, you, you have a very, you know, laser focus on protecting your people um, and uh, and I know that was – but again, you know, going through all that, you know, in 2020 um, as well as, you know, the, the, the COVID protocols, you know, then you roll into the vaccination challenges. Meanwhile, you know, personally you're working through some stuff – with regards to, you know, my father who was deteriorating, you know, with his Alzheimer's and I was seeing the damage that the isolation was causing mm. them um, and many people with um, different types of illnesses and, um, and it was, yeah, it was really hard um, to balance like it out where you've, you know, you've got to hold it together for this uh, and um, for to put on the show and, you know, wear this mask mm. for that. But, you know, there's a part of you that goes like, this is fucking hard, you know, yeah. this is hard. And um, because you, you know, um, which is why then you support people, you know, become oh, so shit. important. Um, and, you know, as I said, I've mentioned them, you know, my friends around the Central Coast, you know, and and my wife and, um, you know, other, other close mm-hmm. friends, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, but I, I thought it was a real defining moment for our game, you know, to um, to get the game back. Um, it's crazy to yeah. think that it was just four years ago and you know, how little we knew because that fear of, like, hang on, mm. the, the fucking... We're going to die if we keep playing here. Well, again, And, I, and, and yeah. even, like, I, I remember having calls um, with the, the senior leadership like the wider NRLC, the elite senior leaders, and it's like, well, hang on, we we need to be careful here because oh, this, totally. this if this rips through, you know, we're going to be killing our partners and our kids. Well, like I, we yeah. didn't know, we didn't know a lot, and there was a lot of fear around COVID nineteen mm-hmm. and some its potential consequences, especially for yeah. people with kids and or that lived oh, in shared households that, with that elderly was relatives. Though, Jenna, was the fact that I mean, we had our players were no different to the community where mm-hmm. you had. They were um, single parents, or they were um, uh, they were responsible for uh, uh, you know an elderly mother or grandfather or uncle or you know um, person that uh, that was dependent on them you know um, based on their circumstances and their you know um, where their health is you know to to see players taken out of that and forced you know not forced you know but largely forced to get an income. If do this, otherwise this happens. It's hard, you know. Um, uh, but you know, players were fortunate that they were able to return. They were able, like unlike many other um, workplaces, um, you know, which suffered um, and um, and still feeling the effects of that. Um, What's well, crazy? And I, so even that, the fact that we were coming back, faced some backlash mm-hmm. from certain sections yeah. of the community and the press. Like, hang on, we like the. The, the people that aired on that extreme side of caution were like, well, no, 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 Australia needs to stop. Mm. And it doesn't, f- footballers and sports people are no different. And, you know, the, yeah. The, Again, I mean, that's where it's a challenge, right? Everyone is, you know, everyone, you know, when things are like that are going on, I think you've got to, you've, you've got to try as hard as it is to take some of the emotion out of it, to mm. th- have that sort of rational to put a rational lens on it based on the information that you've got and you've got to be meticulous um, in how you get that information and the research that's required and the experts that you bring in because ultimately you are responsible for people, our people, and so then to work through it. But I remember like during that period where 
I didn't know what to say to players. I remember staying up till six in the morning to send that the first video message to players to say, you know, look after each other and, yep, this is where it is. And I just couldn't get my words out, I was, you know, like – because he didn't know what to say. Like, you know, this is all new ground. My team, you know, who were, were amazing during that period um, – that they were vulnerable, are they going to lose their jobs, mm. money, money, blah, 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 and all that. So you had an obligation as a new leader to to protect them, you know, um, and often, you know, that uh, in leadership positions, you you know, you, you um, eat last. Mm. And so that's important, you know, to have that mentality because ultimately um, putting others first was necessary. Mm. And um, and I and so I, I you know again I'm I'm, I'm f- we're we're fortunate that the game was able to do that I I, I just I um yeah I, I, you struggle at to to think about you know the the you know some of the people that were so um, deeply impacted you know by that and um but I think our players were community that they are so deeply embedded in community. Then they're unlike a lot of codes in the US and uh, and Europe where they don't remove themselves from community. Mm. They 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 um, they live amongst the community. They are, you know they're deeply connected to that. The cultures that exist in our in our playing group are rooted in mm. community and um, and that and that collegial. Um, <sighs> Um, bond that exists there so I thought you know players were acutely aware of the impact because their mum or brother or sister or dad or uncle had lost their job or you know been laid off Mm. and but you know whatever and we know that a lot of players are responsible for looking after their families Mm. Um, so there's a lot of responsibility on them as well I remember reading a few comments from people like oh who do these players think they are like I've this has happened to someone in my it's like well the same things happened to us like we're the same we've that parent like my parents got covid obviously it was more it was running through in england and mm. people lost people and we knew people that had lost jobs it's like players they weren't immune from that yeah but also i didn't i, I never really took that sort of stuff as as personal because of the fact that that is the, that is their world and their mm. world's crumbling you know yeah. and so they have every right to, you know, whether right or wrong, they have a right to feel. Yeah. And so if that's how they felt at, you know, that time, that's okay. Yeah. You know, um, and so therefore it's just a matter of just mm. controlling what we could control and that was trying to get the game back for all mm. the reasons in which I've spoken about. And, um, but, yeah, that's um, – it was it was it was hard on many levels. It was, it was amazing recovery from the game and thankfully – we got back um, and learnt a lot, I believe. Um, the game is in such a strong position now. But I just want to take you back to the last CBA, which was played out publicly. Mm. Um, firstly, why does it take so long to get an agreement together or, or, or a, an agree, a, a deal agreed upon from both parties or all three parties or four parties, whoever's involved? Yeah, I, I think there's a number of factors that can come into it, right? I mean, it's sometimes it can be um, the level of education and awareness on what is actually required to get a deal done, uh, the knowledge of the industry uh, and the depth in which, you know, a CBA goes into. This isn't, you know, you know like something just on the back of the coaster. You know, this is a comprehensive document that's required to safeguard the game, the people in it, and provide direction. And it's largely a relationship document. It's a lot of people liken it to a commercial agreement. It's not. It sets the framework and it sets the standard in which how people are going to be treated whilst they are in our industry. Uh, and and so like many agreements and disputes, whether it's with unions or otherwise, is that sometimes they – um, there is a breakdown there, you know, obviously requesting information, getting accurate information. There was a number of things around, obviously we were doing a deal within a deal because we had to negotiate the above forecast, you know, um, uh, payback, you know, to players, which was a, you know, which was a massive challenge in, its, in itself about, you know, the accuracy numbers and 
again, some, tr- uh, you know, overhang of trust, you know, uh, issues and how they needed to be worked through and broken down. But again, you know, uh, I think having, you know, the chair of the game, like it was part of all of that. Um, and of course, Andrew and it was, we were also breaking new ground because we were establishing a collective bargaining agreement with women that had never really been, um, consider, had never had a CBA in place. They had some terms and conditions on a rolling annual basis, but they never had this, the protection of what they, and what they deserved around, you know, not just payments, but pregnancy and parental policies and, you know, relocation allowances and understanding the nuance that exists between the women and the men. And they, you know, absolutely there are terms and conditions that, you know, overlap each other, but they have their own um, challenges and various nuance that exists that must be prioritised for their circumstances uh, and what is required based on, you know, they're not full-time professionals at the moment. Um, I certainly, you know, will be striving to, to, to have that happen uh, in the very near future, which is necessary for our game. And we've seen the benefits of it. And, you know, I, I make no mistake in my view, our, our women's game will be the most dominant national and domestic competition in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, in my view. And I think it already is. Mm. I think um, the Matildas are incredible, you know, what, they're, what they've done. And, you know, women's sport in general is piggybacking off the back of, you know, some of their incredible achievements and how they're inspiring, you know, a nation and, and uniting men and women really. Like, I mean, where that's got to and kids. But, um, yeah, yeah, it was frustrating that the, the challenges uh, around the, the length of time uh, and... I can only speak on our behalf is the the fact of, you know, there was obviously the constant press of wanting to get the deal done. Um, fortunate enough, we got it done. You know, it was, you know, it, uh, it was it was painful to to think that the game got to where it did. But, uh, you know, for, for us, there was no other alternative um, because ultimately you are in a position where, you know, what do you do? if you feel like there's an injustice and you feel like there is, you know, more um, to provide players to ensure that they feel like they are partners in the game and they are, you know, fully respected, then um, you're not going to roll over. You're not going to, you know, I think that if you have such a strong conviction towards something, which I have towards the player movement, and the way in which players, you know, must be part of the solution, not the problem, mm. then you nearly have this moral and ethical obligation to do everything you can to ensure that that happens. And um, even to the, if it's the, to the detriment of yourself, um, because if you don't, what's the alternative is what? Like you walk away and go, you know, you dogged that. Yeah. And um, when you knew that you had, you know, you, you knew that there was a moment to, uh, to to do something that ultimately will bring the game together and the game will benefit from this and you, you didn't do it, like that's a lifetime of regret. Yeah. And that's something that the pain of that is um, – that's not how I was raised, yeah. and that's not that's not me. Um, and James, as you know, as a player, you're you're faced with that every day. Like you get bashed up every day. It's hard, you know. Training's hard. No different to other jobs. Like you know, that's hard. Every, you know, there's different hard, right? <laughs> um, and uh, this was just a different hard, you know. Like, but it conditioned. It, you know, you're conditioned to hang on and mm. just, you know, keep stepping forward. Well, and, well that, that gets tested even more as difficult as these negotiations and the things you're talking about would be to deal with in a private setting. Mm. 
But when you throw in the media pressure that this can, um, when the media pressure that adds to what's happening and on a personal level for players, you as an individual and your organisation, the RLPA, how do you manage that when a story would break or be not even personal attack on you yet, but 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 attacking not your ideologies, but your 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 stance and 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 where you're coming from, and that may be not representation, a uh, strong representation of your actual position. Yeah, I mean it's 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 hard uh, because again, if you have this mindset of what you are doing is right and fair and just. For all the reasons that, you know, you've got like your claims are your claims. You've done your work, you've done your research, you know what's out there, you know what's available in other sports, in other sectors, in the workplace, in, in other environments. Why why can't we get that here? You know, why why do we not want to be number one? You know, in, in that in that space. In te- in number yeah. one for conditions for the yeah. athlete. Yeah. Why? You know, so so then if that's your mindset and the balance is that, yep, you've got to take in that. Um, yeah, it's hard. I mean, I'd be lying if I said that it, it wasn't hard and the, uh, the struggle that you go through uh, on a personal level. Um, you know, and in that period, like I lost my father, uh, who was my best friend. Um, we, you know, we had our third child. Mm. You know, this is all in the background and that but that's life you know that's you know unfortunately it's not gonna it, it doesn't wait for anyone uh to it's not gonna wait and say are you ready now like to deal with this you know it just happens and uh and that's like everyone else everyone else is dealing with their own shit you know like and you know i'm no different and everyone's you know got it but it's hard when you know you feel like you just want peace. You just want mm. the game to move forward. You just want us to come together because you know what you've got is so special and you want it to hit the the high notes mm. all the time. And so therefore, uh, yeah, it's it's hard when, you know, different people, you know, you know, you, you are, it gets, becomes quite brutal. Um, in plenty of areas but you've got to learn to rise above it you've got to learn that you know quite often it's not personal Um, you've got to learn that it's um, particular agenda you know or particular way in which helps sell like whatever it is I mean different people have their different motivation I can't control that yeah and I and I don't I don't harbor any resentment towards you know anyone you know, in that space, was I sad and disappointed at times? Yeah, I was. But I also knew the, what waited on the other side mm. and the benefits. But it's hard when you see the impact on your family. You know, you see the impact on my mum and like listening to that and, you know, her still going through her stuff. Um, my, you know, my wife and, you know, your kids are coming home from school and it's starting to infiltrate your space. Yeah. You know, some of the it stuff. It becomes it, part of your personal life because it's, it's being it's, played out in the public domain, yeah. right? And so therefore, now again, my, I can look at it through my lens of mm. it's not personal, like, you know, but they're, you know, they're, yeah. they're going to defensive mode, right? You well, know, my friends, my family. Different. So, and then often you're thinking, fuck, I wish, I wish dad was around, <laughs> you know, like, because um, I can imagine what he would say. But it was kind of one of those things that in many ways, again, you're sort of glad he wasn't because I, there were so many other voices at different times that came out and said things when they didn't have to. They had no skin in the game. Uh, and like literally the outcome was not going to hurt them. It's not going to have yeah. any impact on them. And pe- different people in different sectors, whether it's the private calls and the f- text messages and you know public commentary, whatever it is, that was the thing that it was like, you know, when you're on empty and you're going, fuck, I don't want to put my shoes on today. I don't want to get out of bed. Um, they're the sort of moments where you sort of go, yep, like 
going to do it. And, and I think, um, you know, like you take a lot out of it. I'm very protective of my family. Mm. Um, I remember going to Origin when we pulled the trigger and, the, you know, the players said, no, no, we're, we're not going to talk and, and that and Origin was on. And you, you feel this, it's hard because you've, you've got this love of the game and you know this is a, it's a slash. You just hope that it's not a pound of flesh that kills it, like, you know, yeah. and you sort of go, you know, what's the alternative? I remember walking through the crowd, like through the crowd to get to the stadium and I was thinking, oh, you know, like my mum's here and I'm taking my mum and I'm thinking, like, oh, what is people going to say and, you know, what not? Because you sort of shut down from social media sort of stuff and you try not to, you know, take in some of that. Um, and you can't live your life you know, worrying about what people, you know, think and might say and whatnot because you just don't do what you do. If that's the case, you just won't do – you won't do anything. Mm. Um, and so – but the way in which, you know, people were engaging and you're walking in and this, you know, they're saying keep going and, you know, I didn't have – we didn't have one negative comment. And to see my mum and look to her and she's got – you know, she's crying. You know, that that's – you know, that's like – you know, there's some good people out there, yeah. you know. Uh, and I, I just, again, um, did I want to go through it? No. Nah. Um, was it necessary? Yep. Um, uh, based on the circumstances and the conditions that were, you know, so, uh, again, our players were tremendous. Um, you know, the, the resilience, you know, through that the strategic way in which they thought about things, you know, months and months before that. Um, and, you know, the way in which our women stood firm and, again, you're looking at positions where, again, people can talk about the taping and, you know, oh, it didn't work and all that sort of stuff, whatever. It's like, again, that's their view and that's okay, you know, that's all, that's fine. But it meant something, you know, the connection piece and the players and whatnot and, um, again, did, I, did we want to do it? No. Like, you know, it wasn't like we were looking for fights to pick. Um, but if, you know, if someone steps into your space, that's just the way it is. And Would you change much about the negotiations? <sighs> oh, look, it's hard, it's hard to say. I, you know, I am, um, I, again, I can only control what we do mm. on our side. Um, I think, there were, you know, there, there's, there was lessons to be learned, you know, work through that debrief, you know, it's something that is necessary for our, our business mm -hmm. and the future of the RLPA to understand how do we get there, what are the learnings from that, you know, those types of things because that's part of our history now. Um, and, um, you know, look, I think that personally it's difficult to, to go what would you, you know, what would you change because ultimately nearly every decision that we made was underpinned with reason yeah. and um, and uh, with advice and guidance from people that were that had been through different things before. Um, and again, that's where uh, you got to, you know, the harder it gets, the more you surround yourself with good people. Mm. Um, and that's what, you know, we did. Yeah. And so... Uh, to feel like, you know, which again, there was a lot of criticism about the, you know, the linkage to the unions, it was necessary. Um, you know, the unions and unions in this country have absolutely um, been a backbone of our community and driven change, necessary change for improvements for the worker uh, and um, rightly or wrongly, different people have done different things and whether people have gone about it the right way the 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 matter is has there been progress because of that yes there has mm. would it have happened if it was just left to administration you know corporate bodies whatnot to make a decision that is in the interest of the worker all the time no it's not yeah. it's not going to happen no and nor should there be an expectation that it's going to happen because ultimately your job is to protect the business you have to fight and, for things and you, so, and fight for what yeah, you believe. So in. therefore, there is that yin and yang. Mm. You know, you just hope that you can coexist. Mm. Uh, and so that's where they they were fundamental in that. Where um, 
with the support that they provided, the way in which you know they offered assistance, um, you know, in a multi, you know many different ways. Uh, it was it was something that I never forget. I think that where this where the shift was, sport was no longer just sport, because too often it's seen as oh it's entertainment and mm. it's just you know do that. But it was what they uh, you know what they helped um, with was breaking that that barrier, the boogeyman that's under the bed that oh you can't do mm. that because people you know because you know, sport. It's a sanctuary, and, and you know, you know, and it was like, no, no, like, you know, that's necessary because, again, rights are rights, and work through it. And the pleasing thing is, the game will benefit. Sometimes you need to have a you now a scrap, you know, to to um, for progress to occur mm. and for us to come together and move forward. And that's what I'm really looking forward to is now the the foundation and the runway that we've got, you know, to do it. What what was it like? In and amongst the, the the media fallout, when when perhaps it did get a little personal for you, obviously I was part of the uh, the Triple M team when you came in, and it did get quite heated. I thought it was it was all fair, but you know, and maybe comments after it where where it was probably a bit too personal. What, what how did you? What was your reaction to that when it's uh, purely? I'm trying to do good for these people here. It's, yeah. It doesn't need to become personal. Yeah, thanks for jumping in, in during that interview. <laughs> I thought you um, showed a lot of courage, but yeah, um, so. <laughs> I was just I, I was just watch, I was like the the lad that watches the fight. No, go and on. I think I you know. But again, I, I understood that that it wasn't everyone's fight. Mm. You know, you either wanted to participate or you didn't, and that's okay. You know, like some did, some didn't. You know, some were. You know, well, there, there was uh, probably for me there was parts. I, I agreed with the yeah. Players Association and I probably agreed with the NRL. There were some things that didn't get sorted out, which I was amazed by, but I want to ask you about that yeah. a little bit later on. But I, but I think that that's the thing, right, is that our focus was never on trying to convince people to join our side. Mm. This no, wasn't, but what, this but wasn't, what about when it became personal for you? Well, like it, how, what's the impact of that? Well, again, I mean, you've got to, you've got to have a mindset that this is not personal. Like and whether it is or not, from the from through the other person's lens that is coming forward, that's I can't control that. All I can do is go. Um, if you allow it to be personal, I'm not doing my job. You know, because ultimately you are being distracted from your focus because yeah. it becomes uh, too I see personal. What you mean. I see what you mean. And you you end up and yeah, of course, there's you know. That, you know, there was an ability to say, well, if, you know, whether, and it's, I'm not just saying about any anyone in particular, but obviously if you break the, fr the front person, you know, ultimately the house of cards can mm. fall. Um, but my, for me, it was about trying to separate that out. And if you can't compartmentalise the fact that it's, you know, whether it is or it, it isn't personal, it's perspective and understanding that if I made that personal, it was going to blind me and, you know, and ultimately players suffer and the game inadvertently suffers because if it becomes about me, then I'm not going to press forward. I'm not going to make decisions. I'm not going to think rationally. I'm not going to engage people that, you know, have been through some of this before because it's all about me. It's ego drives it. Ego is something that, you know, wants to be fed, right? So, which is the public facing acknowledgement, you know, and whatnot. But for me, it was never, it was about getting to an outcome, you know, that I believed was right and necessary mm -hmm. and not just me, my board, my, you know, my chair who we haven't spoken about, you know, you know, Dr. Deidre Anderson, who's, you know, the only female chair or CEO in the game is one hell of a woman that supported me and our board and the people there. There are volunteers, you know. Um, but having D there, again, as a, um, you know, to help guide me through and offer support. And the best bit of advice that she gave me was, um, Clint, stay above the line even you know like even when there's an opportunity 
to, you know, don't, you know, like, but more importantly, do not put yourself in a position where you're going to have to apologise to anyone after this. That's good advice. And that really, like, stuck with me. That's really good advice. Because of the fact that if I found myself apologising after it, mm. I've played below the line. Yeah. And it's not my it's not my part of my values to to want to go down that path, um, and that's where you fall into a trap. If you make it personal, you're going mm. to play below the line, mm. you know. Um, and so, uh, and I understand that. Again, I think there was an element of sadness around the fact that, you know, different people that were you know whatever you know were making comments or whatever that was um, that. There was an a there, right there, wrongly from you know have this expectation that that's how people are going to go, but in the moment the sting goes out, you go okay, move on. Mm. Like you know, we just got to keep moving forward, and uh, because again, if you let it consume you, I'm not doing my job, and ultimately that is where you go right. Well, if you make this about you, you have failed, you know yeah. there. And for me, it was not about that. The next gig and this and that, and you know, for me. It was very much about, well, you know, if, it, if the house of cards are coming down, you know, then so be it. Mm. Right? But it's, 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 um, but if you're making decisions that are just and based on principle and values and you've got the experts in around you, you're, you're mitigating some of the, you know, the, mm. the chance of making a really bad decision. Yeah. Um, obviously, head of the NRL, Peter Volandis, what is he like to work with? And against sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know whether we're ever against. I think that we've got our constituents to represent, uh, and I, you know, I respect that. Uh, again, I think that the moment you make it personal, and it becomes on, you know, whether it's me versus him or anything like that, I think again you're taking it away from that. Uh, I, I think that uh, there's been some, you know, some fantastic outcomes that we've achieved i think the way in which we've you know reached agreement on a landmark deal um that allows the game to put itself in a financially strong position with the 300 million of you know cash and assets was a necessary thing for the game knowing where we were and to you know so that's a really important part of um the partnership moving forward because I think that's where it's like, yeah, go and do it. We understand the reasons around it. Go and do it. And then at the point in time that it hits this, we're in. You know, like, and because we've helped get there. And so there's been some really important and fundamental initiatives. Um, but again, uh, you know, I have a you know, great respect for, um, for, you know, for anyone that is in a position um, of significant influence and uh, and has a chance to change the course of history, you know that's. I mean, if you've got the ability to do that, what a responsibility of you, you know, you have. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we've again probably of all administrators in the game, I've probably spoke to him the most in the last four years. Um, which again, it's like sometimes it can be a, you know, a um, like a sibling rivalry at times. You know, um, yeah, um, you know, I want the front seat. No, no. I want the, no like, um, but again, I, you know, I, I think who that, gets it? Yeah, yeah. So um, no, who gets the front seat? Well, you share it. <laughs> Take turns. Yeah. So it's your turn this time to school. It's I'll get it on the way back. You know. So, but um, so yeah. And I think that again, I think we've got some strong leaders. Like I said, I think you know, um, mm. Deirdre is an incredibly strong leader, uh, and I don't. Uh, I, I truly believe the game, you know, uh, is better with having her as being playing her role as chair of the RLPA. Uh, just lastly on CBA stuff, mm. um, is the no is the no fault stand down policy necessary? Oh look, I think that it's. Uh, I think that there is the policy plays an important role. Is it operating? Uh, the way in which it was intended, I don't believe so. Uh, I think there are numerous cases now where we've had a number of years that I think there's an opportunity to look at ways to improve that policy. Are we saying to remove it? No. Um, 
have I ever said it? Have ever said that? No. Uh, I think there's a role for a policy of that nature uh, in our game. I think that there's been times when w- I, I believe that there is an opportunity to review that policy. I think we review many other things in our game that's been in existence for you know um, several years now. And I believe there's some learnings to come out of some of the cases in which that policy has been used uh, that weren't probably considered when that was introduced. You know, whether it is hung juries, whether it is, you know, delays of trials, fresh information, evidence, evidence being thrown out by the court that was ultimately used to charge that person. You know, so there's things there that, you know, that I think there is an opportunity to, to look at. Is it working to the best of its ability? And that's a question that we, you know, you have to ask yourself. It's no different to, you know, are the policies that are existing in our game, whether it's, you know, concussion, whether it's rule changes, whether it's other areas of our industry, is it working to the best of its ability? Is there new information and new evidence to suggest that there is another way and a better way, you know, to do it? And I think having the open mind around that is important. Okay. It, it, it is a, a difficult topic to navigate obviously as a player i f- when it came in i was gobsmacked because it was a, a enacted retrospectively i thought the cba was watertight and it and it shouldn't have come in i'm not against it mm. but um it's hard to see us ever going back well again I, no one's saying to remove the rule mm. people are just you know i think there's an ability to look at it like any type of rule that exists in our land, you know, in the justice system or otherwise, yeah. to look at it and say, is it is it working? And maybe after that process you find mm. out, well, that is. That's the mm. best. I guess something you said before, if you acted on new information, then you're almost telling them they're either innocent or guilty, if that makes sense. No, I don't know, I'm, ta- no, I'm yeah. talking about that if information that was relied upon in um, – in a charge that was laid against a player was then mm. thrown out of the court yeah. because it was wrong, misleading, yeah. not true, bad. You know, someone's um, put forward some f- dodgy evidence mm. that led to a charge which ultimately then leads to the player mm. doing it. Again, It's there is no right to go back to the commission and say, hey, can you look at, can you look at my situation now because mm. that's – that's no longer thrown yeah. out and that was sort of that there is no opportunity mm. for that that's all again no one is saying about removing mm. it. it what we are saying is that if we want to continue to strive to be the best are uh, these policies and codes and you know the way in which the game is played and uh, the protection that we're providing and the support and different you know everything you know there has to be an opportunity to say uh, and is there an ability to improve? If there's not, there's mm. not. Yeah. You know, that's all we're saying. Yeah, fair play. Uh, before we get into the four questions for each and every guest, for each and every guest, uh, the Na- the Jack Newton Classic, um, obviously an important part of your family's legacy. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about that and how much that means to you? Yeah, I mean, it means a great deal because it's part of you know my family's story, my dad and mum's story, uh, the fact that dad... Uh, it, it started in 79 before my I was born, you know, the year my, my sister was born. Um, and we we're a tight family. And so therefore, you know, dad was still playing on the tour. At that point, it was his way. He'd always had a, a, a deep belief that junior investment in juniors was the pipeline and the pathway for long-term success of the code. Uh, and and that was in a in an era where most golf courses, well, all at that point, or a big sorry, not all, a clear majority of them didn't care about junior golf, mm. didn't care about the pipeline, didn't want kids members at their club, didn't want kids playing and clogging up their <laughs> you know their rounds on a weekend. But that was that was where Dad was like, no, no, no that he always wanted to invest in junior sport. That gave him a, a vehicle and it started in Noosa Taunton and, you know, proudly it's, you know, going for sort of 44 years. We've you know, awesome. raised, you know, over seven and a half million for, you know, for, for diabetes and which dad and 
my grandfather had uh, and junior golf. Uh, Dad started the Junior Golf Foundation, which has been the beneficiary of the, the Jack uh, in 86, a couple of years after. Obviously, he had his accident. He was told not to do it. He had no support at that time from the PGA or Australian Golf or, or Golf Australia or whatever because people had that mindset of we're not going to – no, kid, no way, kids, you know, because golf was so, you know, uh, in many ways stuck up in that regard about, you know, you've got to have your socks put up, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. But ultimately what they failed to understand is the lessons that golf teaches kids is everything that society needs. Mm. Respect, respect your elders, scoring your card, um, you know. Um, honesty. Oh yeah, honesty, waiting for people to hit, putting your divot back. Like there's so many different things. Yeah, where there is, yeah. The, and that's I've what never Dad thought of it like that, but you're right. Loved about golf was the there are some deep value sets that exist within our game that extend you know should extend into the community so yeah that's uh it's part of a legacy it's just something else that i do um uh which fortunately enough you must really enjoy that side of it yeah i do i think you know my wife's been fantastic uh in carly and she's taken that on you know and played a lead role in Mm. in ensuring that it continues on uh, because she doesn't have to. Mm. She's sort of married into it um, as, as long uh, as well as married into plenty of other things that comes with our family. Um, but it's uh, but I'm really proud of that too. That we get to share that and the legacy piece around you know my sister's kids and my kids. You know, packing the 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 gift bags, which is what I did. You yeah. know, um, and packing those and being a part of it. Because I think that was also a really big part of our family and where I got to see it was the give back to community. If you are in a position where you can uh, you can make a difference, it's absolutely necessary. And it's part of sort of, you know, whether they were the seven mm. rules of my father or not, but he used to say them, you know, around, you know, the, the, the fact that if you've got a loyal friend, stay close to them, you know, because it's hard to find and it's a sign of strength and character. Uh, don't let anyone tell you you can't do something. Have a go and find out for yourself. Uh, you know, stand up to bullies. You know, uh, you know. Eventually, they'll give up. You know, they always do. Look after your mum. You know, particularly when I'm not around. Um, uh, finish what you start. You know, particularly if it's your drink. Yeah, <laughs> and someone and someone's <laughs> bought it for you. Life isn't fair. So just get on with it and, you know, leave the world better than when you found it. And I think that that's really at the core of it is that if you have an opportunity to make a difference, you know, there's responsibility that comes with that, mm. but take it, yeah. you know. Like, I mean, I think, I, I, I think it's great that our kids like me are able to see the benefits of giving back, paying it forward, you know, doing something that is beyond you and your world, I think that's, you know, that's why I'm proud of the, you know, Jack Newton Junior Golf Foundation. It is the strongest uh, and and longest junior golf foundation in this country um, and we're proud of that and uh, and it will continue to be whilst I'm chair of that organisation and, um, and that's part of, again, our story and it's a part of, you know, my, my mum and dad's story that you, you never want um, to not be told. Yeah. Well, those are pretty sound advice, mate. That's, that's awesome. Uh, the four questions for each and every guest, uh, the dream spine. So one, six, seven, nine, (sighs) no rules. So over to you. Uh, this is a hard one. I've I've had some, uh, great, uh, spines. I mean, fullback, you know, it's Slater. Uh, obviously, my time at Melbourne and what mm. you know what he's been able to do. Um, seven is is Joey because I saw him you know every day. I mean Cooper, mm-hmm. geez, like how do you leave, how do you leave Coops out? Um, six, you know, is, is I'd probably um, is this who I've played with? Oh mate, you, there's no rules. Yeah, there's I, no rules. I, I, but we're anti-authoritarian. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Um, this uh, a six, 
you know, I, I would, I, I'd love to have seen, you know, Joey and GI play. Uh, sorry, Joey and Thurston to play together mm -hmm. at some capacity, or even GI at six. But you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put, I'll put um, uh, Thurston in there, uh, and and then nine is a t is a difficult one for many many reasons where you've got Smith and Badiris. That's a tough call for who you've played with. Good luck. And I don't know whether I can make that call. Uh, um, yeah, it yeah, might. It, that might be one of those ones where yeah, you, you, just you, take, you take the front seat yeah. on the way to school and you yeah. take the front seat on the way home yeah, from school. Yeah. <laughs> that is. So well, that's Slater. Yeah. Thurston at six, Johns at seven, and Badira slash Smith at nine. You're right, mate. I got asked to do a best 17. Yeah. I'm like, I can't do that. Yeah. I missed too many people out. Yeah. It is difficult. Um, if football didn't exist, what do you mm. think you'd be doing? Uh, I th I think I probably would have I would have had a crack at golf. You know, probably. Um, Sock short pulled up properly, collar proper. No, I would have I would have liked to have gone down the John Daly path and really disrupt you know mm -hmm. the golf industry. <laughs> um, but uh, I, and, and I loved woodwork. I love being. A, I love carpentry. Did you? I, I really thought that that was that was me. You know, if if league wasn't it. Oh. Um, Carpentry. I was never a brickie. I, I lasted two weeks as a brickie's labourer. I thought, oh, no, this isn't me. <laughs> yeah, fair Kept enough. on banging my head on the, on the scaffolding on the second <laughs> story. Um, the most interesting person that you've met along the way? <sighs> I've met some complex people. Uh, There's a I, think few. The, I think the most interesting man was probably Bob Hawke. Uh, because my father and him were very close... Bob was very close to dad prior to his accident. Bob went in, came into power, you know, around that time. Um, he provided a lot of support to dad with regards to being the patron of the Jack. He understood, they, they both were just like, you know, not a married couple, but when they were together, they just enjoyed each other's yeah. company, nearly like, um, uh, you know, two bro like you know, two brothers that you'd go shit if they get together. Mm. You know, there's going to be some chaos, and I think Bob probably saw his life play out through. He let Dad play the role in which Bob probably couldn't play anymore when he became Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> but um, but I think that uh, you know I had such a you know deep admiration for for Bob with regards to um, my dad and I would go for dinner with him. You know, you know, once every you know year or two, um, prior to his passing, we'd go to Beppe's. He'd want his favourite spot where he could smoke his cigar in there, and you know, in his room, and you just sit there and listen to the stories. And he had such a passion for sport, and mm. he loved the stories of sport. He loved the golfing stories, and he loved what it was about. And uh, and some of those times where you're listening to you know, how he came to power, like what, how he worked through some of the agreements and the way in which, you know, you work, like it's just, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to have been exposed to, to those, to those moments, um, you know, which when they both go, uh, which now they have, it's, you have the, you know, you have, mm -hmm. you have it's like the, the two people in the Muppets, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, at the uh, Royal Theatre, mm. you know, that they're, they're sort of like they're, they're just so good, they were so good together, <laughs> you know, which was, you know, which was uh, interesting. Well, that's a brilliant answer. I think that's the best I've had. Uh, a sliding doors moment, you think about um, either the the, uh, the alternative or what actually happened? Well, I think it was my how I met my wife. Uh, one, I mean, if I don't, if that doesn't play out the way it does in Newcastle and Melbourne, I don't play in England. Uh, I then got injured in 2008, I booked a month holiday. I had a thing for going on European trips. Even when I was in Australia, I'd backpack around Europe for four to six weeks on my own. Um, post season when people were happy to go to Bali and whatnot, I was going, no, no, I'm going over here. And so uh, I booked in to go to Ibiza and a friend of mine came with me, we went over I get on the plane, I'm sitting next to, you know, this glamour, which is my now wife. And I've never had, I've flown in many planes and I'm never, I've never had a chance to sit next to anyone, like anyone 
that was sort of someone that you're going, oh, yeah, you know, like, you, like there's something about you. I was hung from the night before. It was a 6.30 flight and, you know, I was, I'd sort of been out the night before. How good is that? Getting and on the piston <laughs> before you go on a trip. It's something and, I've and done so, before and I'll continue to and do. And so you do that. I get on the plane. I sit down and I'm going, oh, you know, she's got a boyfriend there, I, I think, next to her, you know, on the – um, on the plane, I smashed two bacon and egg McMuffins and just pass out, like, you know, on the plane, didn't speak to her at all. We go our separate ways. The person I was travelling with wanted to go to a particular nightclub that night. I didn't. I wanted to go somewhere else, toss of the coin. I win. I walk in and she's the first person that I run into uh, in amnesia. It's like 3,000 people. Wow. Like in there. In there uh, and at that point... You know, you're going, well, I – like, and, and at that point I thought she was still with the bloke um, and then it sort of – a few days went by. We sort of started hanging out like our groups mm -hmm. and then at the last day I was like, are you guys together? You know, it was like, no, we're not. You know, I was like, oh, you know. Like, um, and then I said, right, well, I'm going to take you out as soon as I get back from, you know, travelling around Europe. Flew back into Manchester, staying with Matt King and um, Key at the time. Uh, they were at self and and uh, flew back in, took her out, and been together ever since. That How was uh, two thousand eight. Isn't it funny how these things work? Um, well, mate, that just about wraps us up. Um, some of my reflections from this interview. The one thing that really sticks out is hearing about you and your dad going on those car journeys, and like took me back. Like I, I was, you were talking, and I was grinning from ear to ear. Because it was just like, Jesus Christ, that was like me and my old man. Mm. I'm one of seven, but me and him had a lot of special memories watching fo watching games of rugby league together. And, and geez, what I'd get, probably didn't, I'm probably going to call him and say thanks because you just don't know when that chance do might that, go. Cause, do that. Yeah. I advise you like, that my regret yeah. is I didn't ask enough questions yeah. before dad went. Yeah, and you're just like, fucking hell, they were good times. Mm. Like just simple before life got yeah. serious. Like you're just a kid yeah. and you're on the on the wall at St. Helens and or he drove me to Bradford. Yeah. I can remember a game he drove me to Bradford on a Wednesday night <laughs> to Bradford away after Odds we just at Odsall we just beat them in the, in we beat them in the cup final on the Saturday. They play them away in a makeup game in the league on the Wednesday. Saints to play it hardly send it a player worth their salt. But he took me up there anyway. It was foggy as all fuck. But we still went up there and I enjoyed it. And it was those those are the memories that will stay with me. Yeah. Um, and don't forget when you're doing that is ask him how he felt. Yeah. You know, because that's the part that, yeah. you know, your memories come and go. The reason why you hold on to memories mm. in my view is you remember how you felt at that time, which yeah. forces you to remember that moment. Yeah. You know, it's You like, remember how it made yeah. you feel, right? Um, and the other thing is, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember uh, remember – speaking with you after it hung up the boots and you said, Jamma, just do me a favour. You finished now. Just go and get a quiet beer by yourself and just think about your contribution to the game. Not about anything. You said, think about your contribution to the game because it's been uh, amazing. You played against you in England. You've come over here. Not many English people do. And um, it's one of those conversations that I remember. I remember doing it and just having a beer and just going like, oh, yeah, so I want to say thank you for that because it had a really um, it was really impactful on me and thoughts and I was I didn't exit the game. I, it was a magnificent exit, but I, I had my struggles when I was first coming to terms with it. So um, thank you for those keen words of advice. We Thanks, didn't manage to get into what's next, but I think with the values that you have um, in whatever industry that you aspire to be into you will be a success so thank you for joining us on the bar mate. mate we're not done yet <laughs> <laughs>